Good, I think we're good. Yep. So, yeah. so to start, yep. okay, can I start by recording apologies? I've received one from Podrick Delargy. Have any, any others? No, 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 no others. Okay. Committee composition then, members, to draw your attention to page six of your pack, which shows all the members of the committee. And I'm delighted with the exception of Podrick, who will be with us next week, that all members are here, able to attend. From the outset, members, could I say that I am very pleased to uh, welcome you all here and look forward to working with each and every one of you. We do come from different political backgrounds, but I'm sure we all share the goal of we want to grow the economy and support the Minister in the endeavours that he's doing, but also scrutinise what we believe we need to to try and move Northern Ireland forward. Keen at this stage to introduce members and allow them to highlight their priorities as we move forward. So if I start with my able Deputy Chairman, Mr Middleton. Uh, thanks, Chair, and obviously congratulations to you on taking on uh, the position as Chairperson. I look forward to working with all of the uh, committee members over the course of the mandate. Uh, I'm a DUP representative for the FOIL constituency. Uh, keen interest in the Economy Committee, I've been on it before. Um, I have a particular interest in terms of uh, the tur tourism sector, uh, obviously in terms of the North West. I have a key um, you know, interest in terms of trying to ensure that we get our uh, fair share of investment and jobs, uh, but also in terms of the air connectivity piece as well. I think there's a particular interest uh, from my perspective in, in terms of um, you know, growing the economy and ensuring that we get uh, people to and from this place. Uh, in terms of tourism and jobs, so that is my particular focus. Thank uh, you, Gary. Uh, Philip. Uh, thank you, uh, Philip Wigan, MLA North Antrim. Uh, looking forward to the work of the committee. I suppose being a previous climate spokesperson, energy is important, but obviously coming from the representing North Antrim tourism as well, and I mean there's things that we'll be doing, employment bill, etc. The expansion of McGee, which will be vitally important. Sinead. Uh, Shanine McLaughlin, um, I'm a previous member of the economy, I was deputy chair before, um, obviously um, for representing the Foyle constituency for the SDLP and I'm looking forward um, to getting stuck in, I'm very interested in the review um, of Invest NI, um, I'm particularly uh, concerned about regional balance and I'm also concerned about the skills agenda in particular. Thank you, Sorsha. Hi everyone, my name is Sorsha Eastwood. Um, I'm an Alliance MLA for Lagan Valley along with my colleague David. Um, we always do things together. Um, my background is in business and leadership and with a particular um, focus on HR and employment law. So that was my background before getting into politics. Um, I'm also very passionate about manufacturing and apprenticeships. Um, and I would really like to bring a focus um, from my work in the committee to looking at employment rights, um, also looking at uh, union involvement, um, looking in terms of the skills piece. Um, Sinead and I formed an all-party group um, on skills, actually, whenever the, the House was not sitting. So we're looking forward to formally constituting that and doing more work in that space. I'd also be very key to ensure more joined up working um, with other departments, particularly in light of the independent review of education. Um, I had previously expressed some interest in doing a private member's bill on the issue of careers advice in schools. Obviously, that shows in itself the overlap between operational responsibility and policy responsibility between departments. So I'd be very keen to, to do stuff in that space and as well as that exploiting the opportunities that we have with jail market access. Perfect. Thank you very much. Mike. Yeah, thank you very much. Mike Nesbitt, uh, MLA for Strangford. I've, I've reached that wonderful age where Every bullet point on my CV starts the same way. Mike used to be, <laughs> including uh, a member of the last uh, economy committee. I think if I was going to summarise uh, what I would like to achieve um, in, in terms of the economy, it's a prosperity agenda, which would give meaning to that phrase that was so common back at the time of the agreement in 98, the peace dividend. Um, if I was breaking it down into three priorities, Chair, I would say, first of all, Tackling economic inactivity, I know it's come down a percentage point, but it's still shockingly high. Uh, secondly, Mazen, the, the maximum student numbers, where we see a lot of students who would like to go to Queen's or UU being forced to go to England and Wales, where they pay the full 9,000 a year in terms of, uh, of fees. And the third area is tourism, and particularly the electronic travel authorisation, which I think could have a devastating impact. Uh, on tourism here, not least in terms of organised coach tours coming out of the Republic. Thank 
David. And congratulations on your role and Gary's as well. And David Honeyford Alliance, I'm away along with my um, sister, <laughs> Sorsha, <laughs> in, uh, in, in Lag and Valley. Um, so I come from a, a business background. I mo got moved to the economy last, literally last week uh, from infrastructure. Um, and I come from, I've been in my own business from when I was 21 uh, and various business over the years. So my, my, my kind of priorities, uh, prosperity was actually the one that the thought, uh, the, the word I had in my head as we were going around that Mike said and in the widest sense of that the pro so the, 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 the whole place and everyone prospers if, if, you're, if your business community and your economy is going well and everything feeds down from that and that, that's key and, and part of that is bringing money into Northern Ireland from outside and that's it. so export is, is of our business into the south and into, into the EU markets and US markets are, is massive priority for, um, for me and seeing our, seeing our business community thrive um, kind of alongside that, what Mike said about the, the educational piece with with the universities and the universities. I have a, I have a son in England who, who and, a, and a daughter in Dublin, and it's 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 increasing. It's it's allowing them to stay at home and including and making it easier for those staying on the island to stay in, and to access the south and and not not have to pay nine and a half um, thousand and the competition that that brings to our places. So those are some of the priorities for me. So Perfect, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Jonathan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, congratulations on your new role, and I wish you well. I look forward to working with the clerk and the team. Um, my name is Jonathan Buckley, DUP MLA for Upper Ban. Um, I suppose probably going last, I suppose there's not a point that's mentioned that I can't agree with. Uh, it's a very large department with many different facets, and I think probably we'll see over time that each, each one can open up an avenue in, into the other. So I very much look forward to to working with <coughs> colleagues on the committee. Particular probably interest for me would be on the international investment opportunity side. So that will obviously lead us into that review of Invest NI and what it means ultimately going forward. Um, also particular interest in widening the skills base uh, and also looking at the emergence of new technologies and how that is going to affect our economy going forward with particular reference to new AI technologies. So that's a couple of interest points, but I, I look forward to engaging with colleagues on all the points that have been raised. Thank you very much and thank you all colleagues. I think there's a clear diverse interest and more importantly skill set from each and every one of you. So I look forward to drawing on those as this committee does it important work in the next three and a half years. Before I move on, I just want to draw members' attention that the Deputy Chair and I both met informally with Minister Murphy on Monday the 12th of February where he discussed the key challenges facing his department and we will have the Permanent Secretary with his key officials here who will give us an overview of those later today. Turning to declarations of interest, Clerk, if I hand over to you to ensure that we cover that properly on our first sitting. Yes, Chair. Um, if members turn to page nine of their packs, um, as you're all aware, members are required to register relevant financial and other interests in the register of members' interest. Details of registered interests are published on the Assembly website. You know this. I uh, just want to remind members that in addition to this requirement, Standing Order 695 states that a member who has a financial interest in any matter or a relevant interest in any matter must declare that interest before taking part in any proceedings of the Assembly relating to that matter. So in particular, there is a requirement to declare any interests which might reasonably be thought by others to influence the member's approach to the matter under consideration. That's lots of words, but the, the upshot of it is that proceedings in there of the Assembly includes meetings of the Assembly, of meetings of this committee. Um, so I'd just like to advise members that as this is the first meeting of the committee, <coughs> members may therefore wish to ensure that any financial or other interests which relate to the remit of the committee um, or which are likely to be relevant to a substantial part of its work are drawn to the attention of the committee. It should be noted that failure to register and or declare an interest may be an offence under Section 43 of the Northern Ireland Act. So, Chairperson, might I ask if um, members wish to declare any interest and we will record them in the minutes. Sorsha? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to say that my husband is employed by the Department for the Economy. Um, I have that on my own register of interest since I was elected in May 2022. Perfect, no problem. And David? I'm Director of TAS Home Property Development Company, but I'm a shareholder in TAS Properties, which CITB is coming up today, and we would, the company would obviously pay that levy. So. Um. Members, uh, I know you won't mind that I'll probably speak to a uh, member afterwards just to get the, the full name of the, the company, make yeah, sure we spelt it right, all that yeah. good stuff, and so that'll be probably recorded in the minutes. 
So if members are um, content, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it's just to advise members that the rules governing the registration and declaration of interests are contained in the Code of Conduct and guide to the rules relating to the conduct of members, and that further advice and guidance is available from the Clerk of Standards, that's Shane McAteer, who is in room 254, I think. Uh, there we go. <coughs> Very good. Thanks, Chairperson. Okay, thank you. Moving to item five, then, legacy report of predecessor committee and access to committee legacy papers. As indicated on page 12 of the pack, the predecessor committee for the economy considered a wide range of relevant issues and obtained a large number of related papers, many of which are unpublished and which may usefully inform the delib deliberations of our current committee. In order to access these unpublished papers, the committee should agree a formal resolution on the matter. I just wanted to check if members would be content that we put a resolution to the committee that we have access to those legacy papers. So that the Committee for the Economy agrees to access and publish as it considers appropriate all unpublished papers obtained by all predecessor committees. Agreed. Uh, is that agreed? Yeah, concerned, okay. yeah. Happy that we have no dissenting voices on this. Lovely, yeah. Perfect, thank um, you. And just to remind members that on page 13 there are a copy of the predecessor's legacy report is included and a summary of the suggested issues for scrutiny. And I know the committee will want to take some time in the coming weeks that we look at our priorities that we want, what we want to work on together moving forward. Are there any questions on that, members? Are we content to, to move on? So we want to now move into closed session to consider a number of items. Are members content that we move into closed session at this point so we can consider those items? That is agreed. Okay, just, uh... Committee room 30. Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30. Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30. Sound. Committee Room 30, Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30, Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30, Sound. Committee Room 30, Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30, Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30, Sound. Committee Room 30, Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30, Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30, Sound. Committee Room 30, Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30, Sound. <coughs> Committee Room 30, Sound. Committee Room 30, Sound.
Committee Room 30. Signed. 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 (laughs) 
Committee Room 30. Signed. 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 (laughs) 
Committee Room 30. Sound. 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 Committee Room 30. Sound.
Committee Room 30. Signed. 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 Committee Room 30. Signed.
Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed. Boots went out. <clears throat> we drive the chairs asking for what all the programs uh-huh. are. <laughs> I think we're back in the room. Okay, perfect. Okay, members, moving to item number seven, delegation of technical scrutiny to the examiner of statutory rules. Members are reminded that the Economy Committee considers statutory rules, also known as delegated or subordinate legislation. We should remind members that the Assembly's examiner of statutory rules undertakes the technical scrutiny of delegated legislation and leaving the policy scrutiny to us as the committee. In order to facilitate the above, I would be required to put a motion to the committee. The motion being that the Committee for the Economy Understanding Order 43 resolves to delegate to the examiner of statutory rules the technical scrutiny of statutory rules referred to the committee under the above mentioned standing order. The committee further resolves that in carrying out this function, the examiner shall be authorised to report her technical findings on each statutory rule to the Assembly and to the relevant department, as well as to the committee itself, and to publish her report. Are members agreed with that? Agreed. Yeah, Perfect. Agree. I wish to advise members that a number of statutory rules have been proposed or laid in the current mandate in order to inform this consideration. Information on the relevant rules are included from 100, uh, page 120 of our packs. Clark. Very good. So, Chairperson, yeah, um, apologies for this. As I uh, said in form to you before, um, a number of statutory rules uh, were laid while the Assembly was uh, dissolved. Um, whenever the Assembly uh, 
so the, the committee then has the opportunity to pray against those rules during a statutory period. Statutory period is usually 10 sitting days. So because the assembly was recalled a number of times, a lot of those sitting days have now been used up. So the reason I put such a very large number of statutory rules in front of you is that these statutory periods are about to expire. Um, and so what I firstly want to do is make members aware um, that should they wish to pray against the rules themselves, that they are free to do so, but they don't have a lot of time. Um, but also uh, hopefully to get the committee's agreement if they are content um, to um, agree that they're, they're happy enough with the rules. If you're super concerned about any individual rule, uh, officials have very um, gamely agreed to come on to Zoom and they will explain the rule to you if you are concerned about it. Chairperson. Thank you. Mr Nesbitt. Chair, this is not a criticism of the clerk or, or, or anything else. It's just where we happen to be. We've had two years where these have been piling up. Um, my problem is I haven't had time uh, to adequately scrutinise what is before us today, so I cannot endorse them. However, I don't want to stand in the way of moving forward, but I just remind members that the fatal flaw in the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme was in a statutory instrument, mm -hmm. uh, which was not spotted by a committee. I'm not saying there's a similar landmine in the pack today, but I think that makes me cautious about endorsing anything that we're asked to endorse without proper scrutiny. Yes. And the other thing, just to add to that, you know, there's um, many of the members of this committee are new to this committee. Uh, and haven't had any time to scrutinise these at all, even in the last mandate, and it is two years um, since. So I think really time is needed. Okay. Um, do we want to take each individually and then we can afford members the opportunity then to raise their concerns or discuss with officials on that? I'm just conscious that some of these in relation to parental bereavement regulations do require committee approval, otherwise they may then fall. I would suggest anything that's in danger of falling should be examined today. Yep. Okay. So for okay, uh, so Chair, what, what's actually happening is that the statutory period is about to run out yeah. on almost all of oh. these. So, <clears throat> look, I would gladly put them into next week, but um, I can't because the statutory period would run out, and so I would then be deciding for you to not pray against. Whereas this way, um, you have the opportunity. Not much of an opportunity, um, but there is an opportunity to uh, review the rules in question. And as I've said, the um, officials would explain if that was required. Um, but I can explain some of the rules as well and uh, hopefully provide some level of assurance. And am I right in saying, Clark, that these will then come to the Assembly, which will then obviously afford members the opportunity to then raise any points yeah, against? Yeah. Well, the first three are confirmatory resolution, mm -hmm. so that means there's, there's definitely going to be a debate, and the last one is draft affirmative, so there'll definitely be a debate. There's no, no question of that. The rest, um, you can pray against, but if you were to do so, you need to put a motion down probably today um, to do that. Chair, for me then, if, if, if my concern is noted, I, I'm content to move forward. I, mean, I think it's a concern shared by us all. So it's, yeah. it's not, yeah. I, mean, I think we should all be uh, recorded as, mm -hmm. as having the same concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Okay. We move then to number item number eight, which is Statutory Rule 2023-156, Parental Bereavement Regulations. I wish to remind members that the committee will now consider a package of five statutory rules which provide for parental bereavement pay in respect of the death or stillborn of a child on or after the 6th of April 2022. SR 2023-156, the Parental Bereavement Leave No. 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2023, sets out some of the detail and allows employers to claim statutory payments to cover the leave period. The clerk has kindly provided some covering information at page 120. The rule is subject to the confirmatory resolution procedure, which means that it will be debated in plenary and voted upon shortly. This rule is one of a number which were laid, revoked, and then relayed by the department, and this is explained in the clerk's note. The relevant papers are appended to the clerk's note. Do anyone have any questions on this one? No? OK. 
Okay, well, if members are content, I wish to put forward the following motion. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2023-156, the Parental Bereavement Leave Number 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR's report, recommends that it is approved by the Assembly. With the caveat of the other remarks made by Mr Nesbitt on behalf of the entire Committee, are members content to endorse that proposal? Okay. Okay, members. Do you answer? Do you answer? Right. Okay. <laughs> Content with that, Clark? Yes, Chair. No Thank problem. You. Number nine, then, members, is SR 2023-155, the Statutory Parental Bereavement Pay General Number 2 Regulation, Northern Ireland 2023. This is another part of the package of regulations which provide for parental bereavement pay. These regulations amend the Social Security Contributions and Benefits Act 1992, providing relevant deadlines for parents and employers and setting out the notices and information that needs to be provided. Again, the clerk has provided an overview of this at page 194. Again, this rule is subject to confirmatory resolution procedure, which means that it will be debated in plenary and voted upon shortly. Like the previous rule, this one lay, was laid, revoked and relayed by the Department. Does any member have any questions on this one? And again, with the similar caveats, if I put forward that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2023-155, the Statutory Parental Bereavement Pay General No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR report, recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Are members content? Members are content. Members, are you content? Do you need to speak? Everyone's content? Yeah. yeah. Chair, sorry. Yes, sir. I'm sorry to be pernickety, but we're now saying we have considered when we haven't. As a committee, can we change that form of words to note? No. Okay. Okay, I, I, I'm still content that we progress, but. Okay, we're content with that. You're happy? We're content, as long as members, members will answer. I mean, if you disagree, then disagree yeah. loudly, but or, or agree. Yeah. <laughs> the members are agreed. Mm. Agreed. Okay, uh, number 10, I wish to advise members we now move on to SR 2023-157, the Parental Bereavement Leave and Pay, Consequential Amendments to Subordinate Legislation Number 2, Regulation Northern Ireland 2023. Again, this is part of the package of regulations which provides for parental bereavement pay in respect of the death or stillborn of a child. Uh, the regulations also sets out the parental bereavement leave and pay are to be treated in the same manner as other family-related benefits. Again, the clerk has provided an overview of this at page 295. The rule again is subject to the confirmatory resolution procedure, which means that it will be debated and voted upon in plenary shortly. The rule is also one of a number which were laid and revoked and relayed by the department. Members have any questions on this one? If not at this stage, then I'll put forward the resolution that the Committee of the Economy has considered SR 2023-157, the Parental Bereavement Leave and Pay Consequential Amendment to Subordinate Legislation Number 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR's report, recommends that it is approved by the Assembly. With the previous caveats, are members agreed? Yeah. They are agreed. Thanks. Moving then to item number 11, SR 2023-169, Parental Bereavement Administration Regulations. Uh, SR 2022-169, the Statutory Parental Bereavement Pay Administration Regulations, Northern Ireland 2002, again as a part, sorry, 2022, as part of the package of regulations which provide for parental bereavement pay in respect of the death or stillborn of a child. The rule makes provisions to allow employers to reclaim payments of statutory pay from His Majesty's Revenues and Customs. The rule also includes provisions allowing for the settlement of disputes and for administration of the pay leave to be similar to maternity pay arrangements. Again, the clerk has provided some covering information at page 371. This rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. The relevant papers are appended to the clerk's note. The SL1 for the rule was considered by the predecessor committee, which was content with the policy intent. The statutory period for this rule has just expired. What does that mean? What that means is that um, it was that the rule was considered by the predecessor committee. They were happy enough with the SL1, but it didn't actually get laid, I think, until uh, just after the assembly dissolved. So what happened then is that the assembly got recalled. The statutory period has now been used up. So really nobody has scrutinised the SR itself. 
but there is no facility to do so now because the statutory period has been used up. So it's just for members to note there's the, so you're not agreeing to it, you're simply noting, oh, here's the statutory rule we didn't get a chance to look at. Okay, are members content that we note that? Content to note. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, item number 12 then, members, SR 2023-170, Parental Bereavement Persons Abroad Regulations. SR 2022-170, the Statutory Parental Bereavement Pay, Persons Abroad and Mariners Regulation Northern Ireland 2022 is the final part of the package of regulations which provide for parental bereavement pay in respect to the death or stillborn of a child. The rule deals with entitlement for employees who fall into particular categories of employment, including mariners and those who have spent time working abroad who might otherwise not qualify for the entitlement. Again, the clerk has provided covering information to all members at page 387. The rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. The relevant papers are appended to the clerk's note. SL1 for this rule was considered by the predecessor committee, which was content with the policy intent. But again, the statutory period for this rule has just expired, so I'd have to ask members if they're willing to note that position. Members content? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then move on to further education support. Clark, do you want to give an overview of this? One? Thanks, Chairperson. Um, yeah, uh, members, we wish to note that we have five statutory rules which deal with uh, further education and uh, higher education provision. The first one is SR 2022183, the Further Education Student Support Eligibility Amendment, etc., Regulation, Northern Ireland 2022. This rule extends eligibility for support to certain Afghan, Ukrainian and EU students who are taking designated further education courses from 1st September 2022. I've provided some covering information on page 397. The rule is subject to negative resolution and the relevant papers are appended uh, to my note. Can I ask Chairperson if members have any questions? Members, any questions on the set of SRs? Philip? Not, not so much a question, just if I could take this opportunity to outline Again, the opposition to the, the EU resettlement scheme, uh, you know, is obviously is having an impact on, on this. So, I mean, we're noting the resolution, but it's coming from the EU resettlement scheme, which I'd be opposed to. Okay. You can note that. Clark, yeah. Yeah. Person. yeah, thank you. Okay, members, with that then, I put forward the following motion that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2022-183, the Further Education Student Support Eligibility Amendments, etc. Regulations, Northern Ireland 2022, subject to the ESR report, has no objection to the rule. Is that agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Item number 14 members then is higher education support regulations and I wish to remind members that SR 2022-201, the education student support etc. Amendment number 2 regulations Northern Ireland allows individuals evacuated or assisted from Afghanistan <coughs> to accept, access student finance and home fees status without being subject to the three year ordinary residence requirement. It will also allow those awarded leave under the Ukrainian scheme to qualify for home fees and the student support in line with those in other protected base categories. The clerk has provided an overview of this for members of page 418. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure and the relevant papers are attached. Any members, any questions on this one? If not, then I put that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2022-201, the Education Student Support, etc. Amendment number 2, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the ESR report has no objection to that rule. The members agreed? Members. Members are agreed. Members are agreed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, item number 15, Higher Education Fees Regulation. SR 2022-263, the Education Student Support Etc. Amendment Number 3 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2022, amends the Higher Education Fee Amount Regulations. The rule increases the basic and higher amount of tuition fees that may be charged to full-time undergrad students in respect of the academic year beginning on the 1st of September 2023. In each case, the increase are by 1.8%, setting the maximum tuition fee level at £4,110 for the current academic year. This rule also provides a 40% uplift to the maximum maintenance loan support to students, and this rule increases the postgraduate tuition fee loan to £6,500. The clerk has provided an overview of this to members at page 441. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure and the relevant papers are appended to the clerk's notice. Any questions, members, on this one? 
Philip, I just think we should point out uh, the good work of Minister Murphy keeping the student fees well below that of England. Noted. David. I'm not sure I need a declared interest when my two kids get a maintenance. <laughs> no, no, you so, absolutely should. Yeah, yeah, so I have two, two university students uh, not here but receiving maintenance. <coughs> Chair, perhaps I also should declare as somebody that did avail of student loan myself. Well, I also have a student yeah, loan. I'm, yeah. I'm still paying my <laughs> I'm still paying my own. <laughs> well, I, well, I've paid my own. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I think so. Okay. But I did have one. Okay, Mike, you don't want to declare you're still paying your student loans? <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you, Chair, when I was at university, there was no, no such thing. Let's not get into that. Okay, members, um, I wish to put forward that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2023-263, the Education, Student Support, etc., Amendment No. 3, Regulation Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the ESR report has no objection to that rule. Are members content? Members are content. Members, it is a requirement you do have the answer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, Chairpersons. Uh, item 16, higher education fees inflation regulation. You will wish to, I will wish to advise members that the Student Fees Inflation Index Regulation Northern Ireland 2023 will specify the index used in implying inflationary increases to the basic and higher amounts of tuition fees. Uh, paid by students in higher educational courses. The index to be used is the retail price index, excluding mortgage repayments. Again, the clerk has provided an overview of this at page 459. This rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure, and the relevant papers are within the clerk's notes to the committee. Members, any questions on this one? If not, we put forward the resolution that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2023-136, the Student Fee Inflation Index Regulation Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR report has no objection to that rule. Are members agreed? agreed. Members are agreed. We then move to item number 17, the Education, Student Support, etc. Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2024 amends the fee amount regulations. The rule increases the basic and higher amount of tuition fees that may be charged to full-time undergraduate students in respect of the academic year on or after 1 September 2024. In each case, the increase are by 0.9%, setting the maximum tuition fee level at £4,750 for the next academic year. The rule also makes other eligibility and technical changes, which are outlined at page 469 of our pack. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure, and the relevant papers are within the pack provided by the, the clerk's notes. I put forward that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR. I think I got it wrong, so okay. it's, it's that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR. 202419, the Education, Student Support, etc. Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2024, and subject to the ESR's report, is no objection to the rule. Are members content with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Item 18 then is the Insolvency Practitioners Regulations. The next two rules deal with the insolvency measures. SR 2022-241, the Insolvency Practitioners Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2022, appears to make some changes of a technical nature to the authorisation of insolvency practitioners. The rule also makes changes to the requirements for insolvency practitioners to keep records of cases they are dealing with. The rule provides for a broader requirement to keep records of information sufficient to show and explain the administration of the cases and the decision made by the insolvency practitioner affecting the case. The department contends that this change will avoid duplication and reduce cost of insolvency services. Clark, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, just that um, the, uh, it's subject to negative resolution. Um, the covering information is at page 509. Uh, members can Any ask questions on that one? No, if not, then can I put forward that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2022-241, the Insolvency Practitioners Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the SR report has no objection to the rule. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Item 19, then, members, is the SR 2022-242, Insolvency Prescribed Assets Regulations. 
Members are advised that SR 2022 241, the Insolvency Northern Ireland Order 1989, Prescribed Party Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2022, increases the cap on the part of the company's net assets, the prescribed part, that must, in certain circumstances, be distributed to the unsecured creditors of a company which has entered into an insolvency process. The cap has increased <coughs> from 600000 to 800000 and applies where a company's net assets are in excess of $3.985 million. The clerk has provided some covering information at page 521, and again, this rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. Do members have any questions on this one? If not, then I put forward that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2022-242, the Insolvency Northern Ireland Order 1989, Prescribed Part Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the ESR report, has no objection to the rule. Are members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. We then move to item number 20, CITB levy regulations. Um, Mr Honeyford has declared an interest in this. You're happy to remain in for this item, though. Yeah. Well, um, it's entirely yeah. a matter for the member. Sorry, what was your interest? Is that you're, you have a company sure. that pays the levy? Yeah. yeah. The director of a company that pays the levy. I think it's entirely a matter for the member. Um, okay. So, uh, by way of advice then to members, if you feel you are conflicted, what you could do is sit in the public yeah. gallery if you wanted to. Yeah. I'm not telling you have to. Um, we will record you as leaving the meeting. Yeah. Consider the matter. And then um, you can come back again. I'll do that just but uh, when you're in the public gallery, we just ask the member not to, not to participate in proceedings. But uh, that'll be grand. Okay. And we will record that in the minutes. Yeah. So that'll just be item 20, 21. Yeah, 20, 20, and 21. Okay, perfect. Okay, item 20 then is Statutory Rule 2022 184 CITB Levy Regulations. The next two rules deal with the CITB Levy. SR 2022-184, the Industrial Training Levy Construction Industry Order Northern Ireland 2022 maintains a 0.55% levy of which the CITB Northern Ireland, the Construction Industry Training Board, applies to employers in the construction industry. CITB is to encourage the adequate training of those employed or intending to be employed in the construction industry in Northern Ireland. The levy is based on a percentage of the payroll costs of employers in the industry. The rule imposes the levy on the period 1st of September 2022 to the 31st of August 2023. The CITB annual report shows that 50% of firms eligible to pay the levy and the recovery rate of that is 90%. The clerk has provided some information to this members at page 530. The relevant rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure and the papers are attached to the clerk's note. Does any member have any question on this one? If not, put forward that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2022-184, the Industrial Training Levy Construction Industry Order Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the ESR report has no objection to that rule. The members agree? We agree. Agreed. And then item 21 is SR 2023-99 CITB levy regulations. The Industrial Training Levy Construction Industry Order Northern Ireland 2023 again maintains a levy at 055 percent which the construction industry applies to the employers in the construction industry. The clerk has provided some covering notes at page 544. This rule again is subject to the negative resolution procedures. Does any member have any questions on this one? If not, put forward that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 202399, the Industrial Training Levy Construction Order, Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR report, has no objection to that rule. Are members content? Content. Very great. At this stage, if we can invite Mr Honeyford to return to the meeting. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. That was you've done too. Well done, Chair. Way ahead. Okay, uh, item 22 members is SR 2022-261 Industrial Court Regulations. This removes the provision specifying the appointment and resignation of members to the Industrial Tribunal Court and places a reliance on members of the court to hold and vacate office in accordance with the terms of the appointment. The rule is subject to negative resolution and information set out at page 599. Do we have any questions on this one, members? If not, I put forward that the Committee for the Economy is considered SR 2022-261, the Industrial Court Membership Amendment Regulation, Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the ESR report has no objection to. 
do that well. The members are great. We are great. Moving to item 23, then the SR 2023-36 RPI awards regulations. Uh, the Employment Rights Increase of Limits Order Northern Ireland 2023 revises the limits on awards and payments under certain employment rights legislation in line with the Retail Price Index. This includes provision concerning the limit on a week's pay used in the calculation of statutory redundancy payments, the minimum amount of compensation awarded by industrial tribunals where an individual has been unlawfully expelled from a union, and the basic award of compensation made by the industrial tribunal for unfair dismissal. This rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure with information set out at page 568 of your pack. Any questions on this, members? If not, I put forward that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2023-36, the Employment Rights Increase of Limits Order, Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR report, has no objection to that rule. Our members are great. Great. Thank you. Item 24 is the employee leave regulations. SR 2023-223, the Working Time Amendment Regulation, Northern Ireland 2023, are intended to restate the employment leave and holiday payment entitlements that they previously enjoyed prior to the passage of the retained EU law revocation and reform act 2023 this rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure and information set out at page 582 philip just a wee point you know i welcome this uh it means that the working time arrangements are the same as they were uh pre-brexit and, and therefore uniform across ireland it would be useful clark and i don't know if this is appropriate that you know the committee kind of be kept abreast of any changes in terms of employment rights legislation uh, potentially going through Westminster that will impact here and that we're, we're readily informed in good time. Is the committee chairperson content to write the department in those terms? Yep. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd support that, Philip, as well. And I think it's important that um, we do have a good horizon scanning ahead of us on that so that people in the north aren't adversely impacted by those previous rights that they would have held in that situation. Anyone else on this point? If not, are people content with Philip and Sorcio's yep. proposal? Okay, that's been agreed by the committee. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, with that then, can I put that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2023-223, the Working Time Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR report, has no objection to the will. Thank you. We agree. Thank you. Item 25, then, members, is SR 2022-248, Gas Pipeline Regulations. The Gas Pipeline Designation of Pipelines Order, Northern Ireland 2022, will designate a new three-kilometre section of high-pressure gas transmission pipeline connecting Kilroy Power Station, Carrickfergus, to the existing Northern Ireland gas network at Marshallstown. The cost is fifteen million plus one hundred and twenty thousand pounds per annum, which will initially be met by Kilroute as part of its conversion from coal to gas. Once completed, the pipeline will be transferred to the Belfast Gas Transmission Limited, and the costs recovered through the regulated common transmission tariff tariff within gas bills. The department suggests that this will lead ultimately to a reduction in costs to the consumer. The rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure, with information set out at page five nine seven. Are there any questions on this, members? If not, can I put to the committee that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2022-248, the gas designation of pipelines order in Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the ESR report, has no <coughs> objection to that rule. Our members agree? Thank you. Agree. Item 26, then, is SR 2022-290, whistleblowing regulations. The public order interest disclosure prescribed persons amendment number two order northern ireland 2022 revises the schedule of organizations to which whistleblowers may make protected disclosures about dangerous or illegal activity that they are aware of in the workplace the rule adds the office of the environmental protection to the schedule the oep is a body established by the environment act 2021 which covers england and northern ireland and scrutinize environmental laws and plans and undertakes enforcement action against departments. The rule is subject to negative resolution with information set out at page 704 of our packs. Any questions on this one, members? 
If not, can I put to the committee that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2022-290, the public interest disclosure, prescribed persons amendment number two, order Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the ESR report, has no objection to that rule. Is that agreed? That's agreed. Item number 27, which is our penultimate SR, SR 2023-114, grading tourism fees regulations. The Grading Inspection of Certified Tourist Establishment Fees Regulation Northern Ireland 2023 prescribes the fees payable to Tourism NI in relation to its grading inspections of certified tourist accommodation establishments under its Quality Assurance Grading Scheme. The fee structure being prescribed has been in place for a number of years. Following initial review, the Department has decided that the fees must be placed on a statutory footing using the powers contained in the Tourism Northern Ireland Order 1992. The rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure with information set out at page 716. Any questions on this one, members? If not, I put to the Committee that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2023-114, the Grading Inspection of Certified Tourist Establishment Fees Regulation Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR report has no objection to that rule. The members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And then our final SR is SR 2023-0000, Period Product Provision Regulations. That the, uh, the draft SR 2023-0000, the period products, the Department for the Economy, specified public service bodies, regulation Northern Ireland 2023 specifies which public service bodies affiliated to the Department are to provide free period products. The rule appears to identify FE and HE colleges as well as other public bodies such as the Tourist Board invest Northern Ireland. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure and therefore will be debated in the, er, in the chamber, er, plenary session shortly. The relevant papers are attached to note 737. Any questions on this one, members? We are content. If I put forward then that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2023-0000, the period products, Department for the Economy, specified public service body regulation, Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the ESR report, recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Are members agreed? Okay. Uh, Chair, we're ahead of time. Do you want to take a break? Yep. So I think we're slightly ahead of time for our officials. Um, so if we have 10 minutes. Yeah, should we take 10 minutes? Members, members can tell we take a 10 minute recess to allow. Right just no, they're here. Oh. No, they're here. They're there. What do you want to do, members? Do you members want to? Well, if they're here, I would suggest yeah. we go on. We'll go sure, here. go on. Yeah, we'll walk and roll. Chairperson, thanks to officials from the department yes. who were, were on the line for us. So. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> Morning, gentlemen. He's gone. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, they've changed the chair since the last time I was in here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, members, moving on to our next item then. We'll receive an oral and written first day briefing from the Department for the Economy. This is the first of three introductory departmental briefings which the, Econo uh, which the committee will begin today and will continue over the next two weeks. The written brief has kindly been provided by the Department at page 749. And I'm delighted to welcome Ian Snowden and David Malcolm here today. Ian is the Permanent Secretary within the Department and David is the Head of Management Services and Regulation. Ian, firstly, can I congratulate you on your new role? Um, I've worked with you in the past in many aspects and you've been a great public servant so I'm delighted to see you appointed here. Instead of taking money through race now and you can spend money through the Department <laughs> of the Economy so you're very very welcome and David you're also. Uh, on behalf of the committee I just want to extend our grateful invitation to you and hand over to you gentlemen whenever you are ready. I haven't any um, statement prepared, no um, so I'm happy to take any questions that the um, that the committee members have on the on the f contents of the first day brief, or any other issues. Mike, yes. Mike. Oh, chair, thank you very much, gentlemen. You're very welcome. Ian, uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about Tourism Ireland. Uh, when it was set up, it was funded two thirds by the government of Ireland, one third by ourselves. That's now well out of kilter with a disproportionate. Um, funding coming from, from Dublin. Uh, wh why is that and can that be addressed? Um, and so be the, the last time the, um, the remit <coughs> for the funding for um, Tourism Ireland was set under the North South Ministerial Councils in 2016. Um, so that is the 
the baseline <coughs> at which the funding was, was set. In the intervening period of time, since we've not had ministers, the council hasn't met. Um, then COVID intervened and other things took priority. So at this point in time, um, the Irish government has increased the funding. We've been dealing with our own um, financial and budgetary constraints, and so we have not been able to, to match that. So it is something that will have to be addressed by the minister. In terms of um, the, the arms length bodies, as it were, that, that come under your purview, do you have a, a return on investment scheduled so that you could tell me for the, every pound invested, for example, in Tourism Northern Ireland, Tourism Ireland, Invest NI, Intertrade Ireland and NI Screen, what the return is? No, we have for, for some of them. Um, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what they all are. I think Northern Ireland Screen is probably at the top of that list in terms of return on investment, though um, I would have to go back and get the details of the others. I ask that, that you do that and provide it to the, to the committee. So that's Tourism NI, Tourism Ireland, Invest NI, Intertrade Ireland and NI Screen. Thank you. Thanks again. If I may, Chair, just one other issue, which is, is the flooding money for uh, the businesses in Downpatrick, Newcastle, Newry and Portadown. Fifteen million. Do you think that money will be <coughs> allocated by the end of the financial year? And if not, will Treasury allow you to carry it over? Um, the, the money will be allocated. Um, the, uh, in discussions with some of the business representative organisations earlier in the year, they, they had expressed some concern around the end of the financial year deadline. Um, so we have um, made arrangements with the Department of Finance about the use of that £15 million pounds in the current financial year um, and the uh, payments that will be administered through the enhanced scheme that was announced um, uh, before Christmas will run over into the 24-25 financial year. Now, partly that's because some businesses were having difficulties in getting contractors to do the work for them and if there was an arbitrary deadline at the end of the financial year for the use of the money that would rule some people out of the of the support um, so we're trying to obviously people are, are anxious about getting the money and the announcements out but we are trying to design the scheme in such a way that it will meet the needs of the businesses that were most severely affected so it will run into financial year 24 25 yes okay thank you Thank you, Chair. You, sir. Uh, Gar? Yep. Uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, just concur with the Chair, Ian, in terms of congratulations on your role. Obviously, we have uh, worked together in the past. I know you have experience in terms of the North West as well, and the Development Office and DSD. So it's encouraging that, that there's uh, somebody in place that, that understands all of Northern Ireland and, and uh, the various strengths uh, across as well. And obviously, David, uh, welcome to you as well. Um, in terms of the 10X vision, obviously we welcomed uh, the announcement uh, from Minister Lyons back in 2021 uh, in terms of that vision. Um, and, and you've worked almost, that's your, your business plan in terms of uh, going forward. Uh, one of the things that, that you talked about in the first day brief was working with, with councils and working with local areas in terms of sub-regional plans. Uh, could you maybe give us a bit more detail, Ian, in terms of what that looks like? Um, obviously, from a local council perspective, they all have their various uh, local growth plans. Um, and I think it's something that we, we need to ensure that there's joined up thinking from obviously central and, and local government as well. Yeah, well, I think the committee is going to get a more detailed briefing on the 10X strategy from Paul Grocott, one of the other deputy secretaries in the department in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we can go into a lot more detail on, on that. Um, now, the minister has made it clear, uh, I think he'll be making a, a statement to the assembly next week on this, that uh, regional balance is one of the things he's very keen to have a look at in terms of economic uh, development strategy. So what we're aiming to do, um, and again within the context of the overall economic strategy about driving productivity, better jobs and sustainability and inclusion, is to look at how we can work jointly with the councils on making sure their local economic development plans align to, to ours. Um, and I think it's about making sure that both the central and local government components of all of this align effectively um, and so that we can get um, better combined outcomes from what we do rather than sometimes appearing to work at cross purposes. Okay, thanks Ian. And, and Chair, obviously we don't want to prejudge and we look forward to the statement uh, next week and I appreciate that a lot of these issues which you've given in the first day of brief, we have uh, specific briefings scheduled such as the, the city deal stuff uh, and, and other areas. Just one final question from me, just uh, Chair, in terms of th there was a mention of a review in terms of um, you know, f financial sustainability of, of higher and further education. Uh, obviously the Minister indicated that he doesn't plan to uh, increase student fees, but there was a review in, in terms of that. When is, do you know when that review is due to be completed? Um, th there is 
a review uh, planned and was yes. discussed, so some work has been undertaken during the absence of the Assembly and the Executive to, to have a look at that. Um, the, the subject goes much wider than just the, the question of the tuition fees and the level at which they are set. There, there are lots of other factors that need to be borne in mind, and in some ways starting the conversation with the tuition fees is actually starting it in the wrong place. So the, uh, the team will want to speak uh, with the Minister about taking forward that review and, and what it means, but, but fundamentally um, the current situation is that we have a, a limit on the number of students that can be um, supported at the two universities here in Northern Ireland because we have to supplement the income of the universities from the teaching grant. Um, and there's a limit to how much that teaching grant can be constrained before it starts to do actual damage to the provision of, of education at the universities. So we need to take a very serious look at how all of that is funded and delivered. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, lovely to meet you. Um, I've not met you before, David. I've met you numerous times. A um, number of questions. First one, um, what work is ongoing to ensure businesses can take full advantage of the jail market access in Northern Ireland? Um, well, the work on the Windsor framework, we have a, a team that looks at that, um, looks at European and international um, trade and, and relationships and, and trying to understand exactly what those opportunities actually look like and how the Windsor Framework and the protocol arrangements will work in practice. We also work through under Trade Ireland uh, to make sure that we're, we're taking full advantage of that. Um, still relatively early days in all of this to understand exactly what the proposition actually is. Um, I think businesses are very keen for us to be able to tell them what it means in practice. And so that means understanding how the divergence of regulations in particular will work out uh, and what that process will look like in practice. So. Um, we're still um, analysing and scoping out what the nature of the issues are. I had a discussion last week with the new Chief Executive Invest NI, and this is one of the things he raised, that whenever their um, potential investors are speaking to them, they want certainty around these things. And so we need to make sure that we work quite quickly to try to develop that degree of certainty as much as we can. I would agree with that, and I would really want a strong message to go out um, that Northern Ireland is very much open for business and wants to, to seek to capitalise upon those opportunities. Second one is really around the issue of employment rights. Um, obviously, the House hasn't been sitting for two years, so clearly we're devolved space in that regard anyway, but I'm just very acutely aware of the fact that there has been um, more divergence over time. And one of the, the ones that I really want to pinpoint today is the issue of carers' leave. So obviously, we've seen that bill go through Westminster, and I'd be um, keen to hear if the department has any plans to do some sort of an employment um, rights bill to, to speak to some of those issues. Um, this is part of David's area of responsibility. Uh, we did put a paper to the Minister this week on that subject about um, an employment bill. Um, David can talk through the detail of that and more. Yeah, obviously, you know, we, we've fallen well behind uh, for mm. various reasons. Uh, we only had two single acts in the last uh, in the last mandate. So there are a plethora of issues that, that mm. we have we have brought to the Minister's attention. Equally the Minister has come in with a number of issues. He's absolutely keen on protecting workers' rights. So yeah. he is and so we're in current discussions. It was one of the very first day issues he wanted to talk to us about. So I think you will hear more on that in, in the coming weeks from the Minister, but nothing is off the table. Uh, carers obviously I can't say at the stage we'll be on it, but I can I can assure you we'll certainly be we'll be looking at it so we'll briefing on it so we will. Yeah, I, I just just one more of thought. Course. Um, the other big issue then that I really want to try and drill down into is the issue of skills. Um, and Gary had, had mentioned their FE and HE, and my understanding is that there was the potential to have a review of FE across Northern Ireland, and that's the first part of it. The second part of it then is the actual skills strategy itself. And I'm aware over the period that we had the, the two-year um, hiatus, there were issues around the funding of apprenticeships and clearly that is something that we all want to promote and work on. Um, but I'm wondering, and I know this is caveated with the fact that we are um, trying to figure out the envelope as we speak, um, but what are the issues at the minute facing the funding of apprenticeships in, in all their, their guises, so HLAs, all age, um, where is the core funding coming from, where is it sitting now? Um, and then, obviously, the first part about the potential review of FE. 
I'm taking it the funding certainly we you know that not to reopen old wounds about the loss of EU funding but we, we used 10 million pounds of that mm -hmm. towards our apprenticeships which we, we didn't get back so uh, that that was a hit that we had to, to balance in the, the department it meant that we started the year by not being able to commit to all age apprenticeships but actually we have now since been able to, to commit to those so at this moment in time uh, we're funding all our apprenticeships that, that we want to do and we need to do there may, that's not to say it. obviously we're in a new mandate now so the Minister will come in with, with his own priorities and, and he may well want us to look at other issues in other areas at this moment in time there isn't a funding pressure on the apprenticeship side uh, but that said there's a funding pressure on everything so you know, at this moment in time we don't have funding pressure but if we commit to new issues or new areas or budget set that, that could change that's very fluid to us I had mentioned that I was very passionate about skills whenever we were doing our, our um, first meeting there at the introductory session and one of the issues that isn't really majored on in terms of skills and jobs whenever we talk about them is that of health and social care and we know that there are massive pressures across Northern Ireland in terms of the, the fact that we can't recruit but also retain staff in those areas and a lot of that's to do with terms and conditions and pay and all those sorts of things that are slightly out with us. However, that being said, what is the level of contact and joint working that is mandated or stipulated between DOH and DFE in terms of actually sitting down and saying, right, how do we resource our health workforce for the future in a way that we're not just simply leaving it up to DOH in isolation, but we're actually working together? On the um, higher education side, when it comes to medicine and allied health professions um, and the education at universities, then there is very close liaison. It's really the Department of Health advises on the numbers that are required in each of those areas. Health and social care is a kind of a shortage skill area. There's no one about um, in the skills strategy and something that we are. Uh, that, that we are closely looking at about how we can develop the skills and get the, the workforce trained for that. You mentioned the issues about terms and conditions and, and, and wages. There's not much that my department can do in relation to, to that, though we, we can certainly look at making sure that the uh, training provision is provided through um, FE and other sources for people who want to go into that kind of area of responsibility. Um, I think it is known that there is a long-term need for growing numbers of people working in that sector, um, given the ageing population. Um, and so we do work quite closely with the Department of Health on assessing those sort of skills shortages. How, how would that come about? What, what does that look like at the minute? Um, well, it, an assessment's done on the numbers, anticipated numbers, every year. So we have a, a, like a skills audit. Um, is that only in relation to the HE provision for, for uh, health? No, this is for or in or relation all to all kinds of skills all across of the whole of the uh, whole of the economy. And, and within that, health and social care is one of those sectors that is considered. And um, that, that, that's the level? Mm -hmm. That's the level. <coughs> Thanks. Interesting. So it's just on the health and social care, the, the data is only our Jesse, so forgive me. I, uh, uh, you'll be able to source it, but you know, last employment rose year on year by 1.9 percent. Here last year, it's about 15,000 jobs, and the most of those in the public sector were in the health and social care field. So it's obviously an area that is growing. There's obviously a pipeline that's getting through. Can we do more? Of course we can. Can we do better uh, at that? But but you know, I think that shows the importance that the public sector has been putting and investing into the the health and social care side. And clearly, our FE colleges have a big place around vocational training. It's not just what HE does. And, and again, the minister is absolutely keen to look at the numbers in the FE sector as well. That's an area where we want to really push on, and, and that will maybe address some of the other areas in health and adult social care uh, that we need to we need to focus on over the years ahead. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that because I think there's a, always a temptation to sort of lean into the HE end of things um, in terms of AHPs and stuff like that. But I think the challenge facing us is that we do have a very tight labour market, as you've said. We do have this perverse situation where. We have more people reported to be in work ever in the north, but yet we have massive gaps in terms of what we need. <coughs> and obviously, it's not for the purview of this committee necessarily, but obviously, we do have an issue in terms of um, immigration and how that impacts on Northern Ireland and how that really impacts on the skills pipeline. Um, but no, I think that's something I'll be watching very closely going forward. Thank you. Thank you, so much, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair, and welcome Ian and David. I look forward to working with you through the through the committee. I suppose my question is just want to focus to say on Invest NI, if, if you don't mind. And there's been much commentary surrounding its performance and effectiveness, uh, both pre uh, the assembly falling and indeed during that period. So I suppose I would like 
if possible, for uh, an update on the, the progress of the action plan mm -hmm. uh, in particular. And also one thing that's pretty much unanimous in terms of the businesses that I would speak to is obviously Invest NI certainly has a very good reputation internationally, but quite often our own indigenous businesses have quite a low view of how the organisation has operated over the, the past number of years. So one of the key findings was strengthening public understanding of Invest NI, its work and how the public monies are used. Could you maybe elaborate a wee bit on how the action plans meet that particular finding? Yeah. The action plan was published on the, the 4th of October um, last year, um, produced. Um, there was a, an update meeting on, on the action plan last week. Um, and uh, went through a series of actions. Now, there's good progress being made on the majority of the actions, and, and some things are, are taken uh, a little bit longer than we than we would have hoped. But across the board, there's there's quite a lot of activities going on in relation to that. Now, we've, um, in the past month, had a new appointment of a new chief executive. He's coming on board. There is a new chair uh, who will take up post on the first of March, um, and now a new minister and. I am new into the department, and, and so I think there's an opportunity for us to start again afresh with the relationship to make sure that, that Invest is operating effectively. Now, they, they did a like a very good job with the remit that was set for them over a long number of years, which was uh, their, their, their task was to in, you know, promote jobs and, and bring jobs to, to Northern Ireland through FDI. Um, now, um, as, as Ms. Eastwood has said, the, the circumstances have changed. We've now got very high levels of employment, full employment almost, and very low levels of unemployment. Um, and so they, the, the task has got to change to move with the economic conditions that we've got. And that's what the Lions Review was making the point about promoting productivity. Um, now, the, the point you made about the indigenous businesses and, and how they get access to Invest NI, um, in discussions with the organisation, they, they tell me that they have quite an active regional network um, in Invest NI. And there's a lot of activity which is going on, which maybe doesn't get the attention or um, is not as visible. Uh, possibly as some of the more high-profile kind of work that they do with with Invest NI uh, and, and, and inward investment. Sorry. So I think that um, th there's plenty that can be done to promote that side of the of the organisation's business. Certainly, it's something that the minister, um, in his first couple of weeks, has been quite clear with them that he would like to see more done to see what can be done to help small, and medium-sized enterprises and indigenous businesses. I, I think it's key. I think one of the gaps that was identified in the Lions review was indeed that aspect of communication with our indigenous business and what they can avail of. So that's something certainly that we can watch going forward. Have we got particular funding concerns surrounding the implementation of the action plan and do we have a timeline of when the action plan will be complete? Um, there's, there's no particular funding um, problems with the, the implementation of the, of the action plan. That There might be some internal restructuring required of Invest NI, which um, they will be uh, having to, to look at and work through the detail of it themselves, and they want to talk to the department about that um, whenever they have their plans uh, finalised. Um, beyond that, we don't anticipate that there's going to be significant costs to implement that action plan. I think that some of the actions are um, relatively short term. There are other things you want to see um, embedded in changes of uh, behaviour and approach. Uh, which will be a longer term thing, which um, I will be wanting to work closely with the new chief executive to make sure we, we can get those things embedded, as opposed to um, hitting deadlines and target dates of a particular type, but to make sure that the change is actually sustainable and real. And timelines? Um, so there are a number of them which are quite short term, and then there are some things which are going on into, into the rest of the uh, coming financial year. But the, the, the plan is published online um, and there, you can see where all the, the timelines are all on, on that. And we're on target to, to meet that? Well, like I said at the start of the, the answer, yes, some of those things are on target. There are some uh, some of those actions which are, are popping up as being amber um, in, the, um, in the most recent return that we've got and the discussions that we've had about pushing to make sure those things are actually being taken forward and delivered. Okay, and finally, Chair, just in relation to one of the big bugbears is obviously duplication. I know that's something certainly that the Department have always been worried about, that sometimes it could be counterproductive. So in relation particularly to city deals uh, and the collaboration between Invest NI and local councils, are we competent that, are confident that, that certainly the relationship going forward will lead to delivery of city deals on time and indeed uh, have the impact in which we all have envisaged? Yeah, there, there are important um um, considerations in the city deals projects um, the, the projects that um, uh, this department is looking after um, will all have significant ongoing revenue 
re requirements to make sure that they, they run and operate. So as part of that, you've got to make sure that the projects are sustainable and they will have a lasting economic impact. So we, we do have to make sure that the projects themselves are going to be robust, and that they are the correct things to do and they're being set up properly. Now, having said that, we also need to make sure that we are providing those organisations like the universities and the councils which are delivering the projects with support to move them along. So it's not simply a, 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 a process of asking significant load of, of questions. Now, um, I haven't had a look at it since I've arrived in the department. I think there's there, there's some things that we can do with Invest NI to try to mm -hmm. smooth that process out, to remove that duplication where it is perceived that it's happening, that the same questions are being asked at multiple different layers of the of the process and work more effectively to move these projects along more quickly. OK. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. David. <coughs> hey, thank you. And I uh, haven't met either of you. As, uh, <coughs> so really pleased to meet you. And, uh, and look forward to working together. Um, for the first thing that uh, sprung to me as I read through, the, and thank you for the, the first day uh, stuff, was in the vision it says working for a better uh, economy. W what does that mean? What does that word better mean? Is that we uh, talked at the start about wanting prosperity, or my, my, my view of prosperity across, but the word better is very easy to put in a vision, but what, how is that defined? What is that? Um, well, there are a number of metrics for the, that go along with the 10x vision, um, but principally it's about the economy being more productive in terms of output per person uh, or per hour worked. Um, it's also about it being more inclusive in terms of the uh, opportunities that the economy offers being available to all parts of uh, North Island society, all groups within it, um, whether that's disabled uh, women, ethnic minorities, uh, young people, <coughs> old people, whatever group you want to have uh, a look at, and also regionally inclusive <coughs> in the sense that equal opportunities are, or equivalent opportunities are available in all parts of Northern Ireland. And then there's also the sustainability aspect, uh, which relates to obviously climate change obligations and net zero. Thank you. And then I just want to, to invest in it, just to follow on from, from what Jonathan said, uh, the sort of concern around the profound change uh, term in that. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, I appreciate your answer there about re rejigging and reform within Invest and I to, to look at the regional I've been in business, I've been a client customer over the years with uh, Invest and I, and they've gone quiet in the last little, or my perception is they've gone quiet to, to, to local, to business, to support here. But uh, w w what source you follow on what source you say we're, uh, and that dual market access and being able to to, to maximize that we can we can shout about it and, and scream about it here all we want any business can shout the product they've got but if they don't tell the world about it um you might as well not have it so what are our invest and i capable of of being able to sell northern ireland on that world stage for that dual market access um, I don't think there's any doubt that they have that expertise in the organisation. A lot of people have um, been working on Invest NI over a long number of years and are you know, deep experts in, in all of this stuff, much more than, than I am. Uh, and certainly now that um, Kieran O'Donoghue has joined the organisation, he brings the equivalent expertise um, from the IDA in the Republic. I think there's, there's definitely the capability in the organisation to do it. Um, if the organisation has gone quiet, um, it is probably an indication of some degree of internal... Um, disruption because of the Lions review and the falling out and the working out of that. Um, what we've got to do as a department, working with Invest NI, is to make sure that whilst we resolve all of those issues and they are important, that that does not distract attention from the core function of the organisation, which is to promote economic development in, in Northern Ireland. We need them to be an effective delivery partner for the department um, to deliver the policies that we want. Um, and so I want to make sure that in dealing with all those governance issues that were raised by Lyons, that, that we, we aren't um, basically saying that's what's important as opposed to the delivery of the function of the organisation. Will yeah, they just, have, sorry, sorry, it won't just be for Invest to, mm -hmm. to sell more land. We had two major economic conferences here last year, one organised by the UK government, one organised through the US Special Economic Envoy, Joseph Kennedy. So, so there is a, a tremendous amount of work going on already to sell North Ireland PLC. So there is an Invest, obviously, will be a major part of it. They have offices in America as well, and they've, they've small teams overseas <coughs> that do that. So you know, th they will be a very key player in it, but there's already a tremendous amount of work that, that's underway there. I totally agree, and it's the First Minister, Debbie, First Minister's office, all of our, uh, to, to, to sell them, not saying it's only this amount, but do they have the capability in one hand to, to look after the indigenous business and grow what we've got here, and equally 
um, sell uh, for FDI uh, on the, to bring in to Northern Ireland? Are they is the investment there? Are they capable of? Or do they have the the scope of be able to to cater for for doing both of those? Because our indigenous business here needs to grow and and needs mm -hmm. the support, but equally we need. The, the the foreign investment in or is investment able to do those both roles? Yes. If we, if we uh, get to the point where we're, the organisation um, has has got through, the work needs to be done in response to lands, and we are working jointly, and, and they have a clear mandate from the department and the minister about what is required. Um, I don't doubt that they will be able to respond. As I said in response, I think it was to Mr. Middleton, that they, they do have a very active regional network of offices, uh, and they are working quite closely with with businesses across Northern Ireland on a regular basis. I think um, they, they certainly have got the capability to do both of those things. Um, we've just got to make sure that they are freed up to do it and are effective. Well, and then just on a slightly separate point, but, but equally sort of following on from it, in the report about the US envoy, and you've just uh, you've touched on it there with the, the you know, bringing the, the, the 100 businesses over, or the, the conference that we had in October, and, and that's all to be really welcomed, and, and the more of that, the better. But whenever you look at Northern Ireland's figures, you've, our, our exports out are 2.6 billion to the EU. It's, it's tiny compared to the rest of the world. It's half, nearly, of what the rest of the world is. Is there an argument that we should be looking also for an EU ambassador? And somebody to, to maximise the value. If I have a, if I have a business and I have a market that I have free access into, and I'm doing very little in it, surely that's the place where we should be, um, really prioritising growth and looking at growth. And is there room, or is there any, um, looking at having an ambassador to, to increase our our value of sales and export into the EU and vice versa? There, there, some of that is a political. Um, arena, which I'm not going to stray into. I'll, I'll talk about the practical issues that which we we have encountered. It has become apparent in early stages of the operation of the of the protocol that um, some parts of or some businesses uh, in many parts of the EU don't understand what the protocol means, uh, and this dual market access is not actually understood to them. So they will reject goods from Northern Ireland, believing it to be from outside the EU because it hasn't had the customs. Sometimes customs officials don't understand the rules in some other EU countries. So there's quite a bit of work that we could be doing and, and are trying to do um, both through the UK government and with uh, EU uh, counterparts to try to make sure that knowledge and understanding is, is expanded out because I think that's the first barrier. Then going beyond that, I think we will get into um, what work we can do in the EU to promote um, Northern Ireland, um, obviously as, as part of the all Ireland Intertrade Ireland body um, as well, and making use of, of that to make sure that we do get maximum benefit. Um, but I think first order of business is to make sure that people understand um, what the situation is. Thank you. Thank you. David, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, and um, it's good to have you on board as well as Permanent Secretary. Congratulations and um, uh, to you. Welcome as well, David. Um, three areas, possibly four, probably. Um, higher education. Um, you have given us in your first day uh, report uh, brief about higher education uh, expansion, and you've, you've, you've dealt with McGee as well. Obviously, we're far away from where we want to be, which is um, 10,000 students, and that's, um, that even in itself, that number is lacking ambition. Um, University of Ulster have um, indicated their pathway to increasing numbers, and they have increased numbers, and that is to be commended. However, um, it, it's nowhere near where we need to go. So that is a policy decision within the department, and, uh, and it is an historic one that 80% of higher education students are based in Belfast. Um, what, um, what steps are, are, is the department taking in order to, to rectify that and to support the North West get to the 10,000 students? I think the um, economic benefit of university, having universities, um, it could be, will be constrained for as long as we have to have a maximum student number cap in Northern Ireland. Um, whilst that remains, what we're going to have is a, a discussion about where those student numbers should be. Um, and I think our, our view on it would be if we can resolve the higher education finance issues and that whole review of how, uh, how it is financed. Um, the objective would have to be to remove the maximum student number cap um, so that we're not saying 
places um, and student numbers need to be moved between different towns in Northern Ireland because that immediately gets into a, into a disagreement about relative priorities for towns. The, the expansion of, of um, McGee uh, or any other university in Northern Ireland is only really going to be sustainable and deliverable in the long term if we can deal with that, that maximum student cap number. Um, so that's where the review of higher education is going to be very important to make sure we, we address that. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the Minister is meeting with uh, the Vice-Chancellor of Ulster University today um, up in the North West, and I'm sure these are, are subjects that he's going to be discussing with them. Mm -hmm. and, but if you do remove the maximum student numbers, you would have to specifically remove it for that campus as opposed to removing it generally, because that doesn't fix the policy direction mm -hmm. um, in, in relation to placing students in the area where it is most needed in order to transform our economy. Uh, and we talk about regional balance, but we need to have that positive you know, uh, impact by by doing something for the Northwest specifically in order to raise to raise it. So um, it's still it, it's it's still ideally not getting it to the right place unless it's specific to um, that campus. And uh, there there's been much talk about the Royal Irish Academy and their recommendation to create an independent cross border uh, oversight body into the development of higher education in the Northwest. What's your thoughts on that? Um. Unfortunately, that's one of the things I haven't got round to looking at in my first 10 weeks in the job, so I'm, I'm going to have to have a look at that for you. Um, oh, I think back. it is really important that okay. we explore all options and how we get to where we need to go. And then um, the overview of, of Invest NI, obviously um, uh, that was very welcome, uh, the review, uh, and uh, a major focus um, uh, again uh, on uh, sub-regional targets uh, from, from our perspective. How, how do you believe that we could measure um, uh, regional uh, regional balance? Because you talked about just different measurements about you know productivity uh, being more inclusive, but you also talked about regional inclusive. How would you measure regional inclusiveness? Um, at, at the high level, when we know that it's working, it's in relation to things like um, median wages, uh, for example. That relates to the quality of jobs. It relates to things like employment levels, um, unemployment levels, and all the other key economic measures that you would put in place to measure any kind of process. So once you start to see a reduction in the degree of disparity between one part of Northern Ireland and another, then you will see that the regional imbalance is being addressed. Would you believe that a disposal, a disposable income is a major part of that? Well, that then is linked into your, your question about median, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, pay, median good pay. jobs, good, uh, good quality jobs uh -huh. being uh, a key factor in that. Uh -huh. Okay, that's that's good. And then the other the other thing that it talked about in the in the review as well about the the Invest NI team itself is predominantly based in Belfast. Over five hundred and 50 plus employees are in um, that Bedford Street um, and there was talking about you know putting senior people into various other places within Northern Ireland. Is there um, action taking place already on that happening, Mo moving people? Um, well that's a matter for Invest NI to, to, to address <coughs> you know, in, in terms of how they organise themselves and restructure their, their organisation. Um, I'm not aware that they have any particular plans on that at, at the minute. Um, but that would potentially involve a significant investment in things like office space, which obviously they would have to come to the department for for approval on in mm -hmm. relation to the, the cost and the value for money of any of those sorts of propositions. But I haven't seen anything. I don't believe something on that. Maybe, Siobhan, just to uh, sorry, just on on the issue you raised, the figures yesterday that showed that we had the greatest employment across the UK, 1.9 percent. But Darren Sivan Council had the lowest of 0.2%. So the point you make is, you know, we see that in jobs. So recently, the department has an approval process for, for cases that come from Invest. Uh, they recently they announced the, the significant expansion of the EY jobs that they were going to support. And when that came into the department, actually, we rejected that because it didn't have a regional balance to it. It was to Belfast-centric, so it was. And so we pushed it back, and we asked them not just uh, to, to look at the regional balance, but also the inclusivity of how do we get more people who are economically inactive 
back into the workforce. And so we have controls that we have been using. I suspect with our new minister's interest in this area, we will be using those even further to push on to invest the need to make sure that when they're investing, when they're bringing FDI into Northern Ireland, that they actually are looking at areas and funding and, and rewarding those organisations and companies that want to invest in areas of, of high unemployment or high deprivation. And that's how we will tackle some of the regional imbalances that, that I know you're, you're acutely aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other, um, in your briefing as well, um, you talked about the city deals uh, and just where they're actually currently standing. And there was um, some concern regarding the, the uh, progress in, in the Dairy City and Strabane District uh, city deals. Can you talk us through that and, and how we can manage that going forward? Yeah, so there are, um, there are some questions outstanding on the business case for the expansion at the university. Um, we're waiting for the university to come back on the, in relation to the business case. Now, um, like I mentioned in in response to one of the other um, questions about the progress in the city deals and how we can speed that up. So um, this is one area where I think we, we can, as a department, be more proactive about helping the university understand what it is that we need to see to give us the assurances that are necessary. And, and some of these are, are, are significant in terms of things like industry buy-in uh, and, and so forth, and some of the projects that are being proposed, and then make sure that they are going to be top quality projects when they when they are delivered. I think that there might be an element of the question that gets asked, and then you know, uh, we, we await a response as opposed to being slightly more proactive. So um, one of the things we've discussed um, with the team is whether we can change the way we approach that kind of uh, situation, not to, um, you know, fetter our ability to make decisions whenever it's necessary uh, and, and appropriate approval processes, but actually put some kind of mechanism or process or resource in place which would allow those things to be moved on faster. So um, the, that's something I'm sure that the Vice Chancellor will be discussing with uh, mm -hmm. the Minister today, um, and, and we have some ideas about how we might move help move that on a bit further, just to just to try to, to speed it up. I think that's really important, you know, uh, and we look at the uh, progress of the Belfast uh, regional city deal, uh, and um, they're much further ahead. Eleven projects have been uh, uh, passed. I know we're our heads of term probably uh, are about maybe a year, year and a half uh, later. However, you know, we, we've just got one project over the line, and that's just uh, uh, like very recently in the last uh, few days, the the, the, the museum. Yeah. Um, so it, it really is, you know, if we're talking about regional balance, we need support and we need extra support yeah, in question, order to get us forward. Sorry, one final thing. City of Derry Airport connectivity is really important to a small region and regions in the periphery as well. Um, what are your intentions around supporting that um, airport and what, what's the role of the department in that as well? Uh, the department doesn't have a, a, a remit to support airports or, or involved yeah. in airports. Uh, that, that sort of um, falls to the Department for Infrastructure. Um, what we have got an interest in is air connectivity. Yeah. Um, there is a public service obligation route between uh, City of Dairy Airport and Heathrow at the minute, um, which is part funded by the Department for, for Transport. Um, uh, the Minister will be making an announcement about that today when he's in the North West. Thank you. Philip? Thanks. Chair, I just welcome you both and just to concur in with all the positive remarks about good work and relationships with you in your previous role and congratulations and good luck in, in time ahead. M my question is uh, on the energy strategy, perhaps just an update on that and how soon we can expect uh, a renewable grant scheme uh, yeah. in the near future for businesses and uh, homeowners. Um, i take the, the second question first. The, the, um, the funding for a new renewable grant scheme would be tied into a resolution of the issues that have been outstanding on the um, RHI scheme. Um, I've had a couple of meetings with the, the team in the past couple of weeks uh, about moving that forward. Um, we'll be making um, uh, making recommendations to the Minister about how to take that, that on. Uh, unfortunately, until we have that resolved, the, the money that is uh, connected to um, renewable, um, re renewable funding schemes um, is sort of tied into that, and, and the Treasury has been has been pretty clear that it wants to see um, a resolution and removal of any risks around legal action and so forth uh, connected to that. Until until that is done, um, then the money is not really available to spend. There are other schemes that are being considered and developed, um, and we're looking at some of the schemes that are being um, being brought forward across the water, but how they might be adapted into. Uh, into Northern Ireland circumstances, uh, though of course there will be have to be detailed consultations and all of that 
that moving forward. Now, in the bigger energy strategy, um, we have got a, a very stretching target uh, to, to reach about the amount of electricity um, produced from renewable resources. So it's, it's to be 80% by the year 2030. Um, and we're currently at 47%, something like that. So there used to be a very significant shift um, between now and then. Now, uh, we have been doing quite a bit of work um, uh, in relation to things like offshore wind production, uh, and uh, there's been a number of consultations during the period of time when there were no ministers around how we might take that forward. Uh, again, we we'll want to talk to the minister about the strategy on energy. Um, it's one of those key things that we need to be, to be moving forward with quite significantly. Okay, and then uh, just my second and final question, uh, and it's, I'm disappointed to say it's something that's not in the, the, the first day brief. Uh, uh, can I just ask in relation to the department's decision not to take forward the joint island bid on bringing the Tour de France here on the 26th, 20, either 26th or 27th, and Chair, if I can declare I'm, I'm a member of Cycling Ireland, uh, but I mean, we all witnessed the potential that and the goodwill and all of that from the Giro when it came. I mean, the Tour de France is infinitely bigger. Uh, I mean, you take the Olympics, the World Cup, the Tour de France is the third, uh, I think, the third most viewed uh, international sporting event. And, you know, it would bring p uh, massive potential in terms of, of tourism and uh, economic uh, potential to the north. So, uh, I say, uh, from a personal point of view, I, I was really disappointed. But obviously, this is a bigger thing that that I that I think lots of businesses and tourism and and, and our e economy will be disappointed that it, the bid's not been taken forward. So maybe if you could outline some of the rationale for that. Um, it, it it really boils down to the the cost. Um, in the absence of ministers, um, the constrained position of the budget in the department, um, and the fact that. A decision to fund um, the bid on the um, on the Tour de France would have required something else to be cut, and in the absence of ministers, it is the um, you know it's the, the legitimacy of a decision taken by an unelected official essentially to cut something to fund another thing um, is really what's missing, um, and. Um, Mr. Nesmith mentioned the flooding schemes. It's, it's another example of where the absence of ministers um, has has made it difficult for departments to actually respond to uh, opportunities such as this. Now, um, I think if you have politicians in place, they can make those decisions. But uh, the simple fact of the matter is the department's budget was incredibly tight. Um, we were looking at more cuts next year in order to be able to live within what we've got. <laughs> and essentially to say, here's a new thing with an ongoing commitment. Uh, it wasn't simply the one point, was it 1.4 million next year, it was you know, potentially tens of millions in subsequent years to make this happen. Um, in the absence of a minister, we didn't feel that it was legitimate for us to take that decision. Just a wee supplement in terms of, obviously that decision is made, but I mean the work that's done, uh, is, it, is this something that can be resurrected uh, in terms of a, a new joint island bid uh, in the near future? Yeah, I think when the, the decision was announced, I mean, we did make it clear that we were very open to having um, a look at this again uh, in future years if the, if the conditions allowed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could just ask you a couple of questions, gentlemen. Firstly, uh, the recent UK government command paper referenced Intertrade UK, a new body that's going to be set up by the UK government um, to continue to promote uh, trade within the UK internal market. Does the department recognise the importance of that market for our businesses here in Northern Ireland? Obviously it is a very important market. The um, majority of, of exports from Northern Ireland go to, to Great Britain. Um, in terms of the inter um, East-West Intertrade Organisation, um, there's not a lot of detail on that at the minute. What uh, The primary function of it will be to promote Northern Ireland businesses in the Great Britain market. Um, that's why um, it is being established. Um, and we'll be working with the Department for Business and Trade in relation to how that might be set up and operated. Um, but we have, we have started to look at the, the work that was done around the establishment of Intertrade Ireland you know, as being a starting point for, for how that might work. Uh, any views from the Department in terms of potential revenue raising if you were requested by your Minister to raise some revenue? What options do the Department currently have on the table? Um, the, the biggest single one um, is in relation to um, student tuition fees um, for universities. Um, so we had a uh, we had actually been instructed by the Secretary of State in September to produce that consultation paper. Um, so 
quite a lot of work was done in a very detailed paper um, and you know, covered all the issues and and a very clear uh, explanation of what the you know, the pros and cons are of the different options. Um, it had been just after I arrived in the department, we, we passed it on to the Northern Ireland office because they wanted to see all these documents before they issued. It only came back to us um, literally the, the week ending the 2nd of February, um, at which point I thought I'll maybe wait on Saturday to see what happens. Um, and so that's um, um, that's the position we've got to, so the, the Minister has is, is not... Uh, he's, I think he's publicly said he's not keen on the idea of increasing tuition fees. But we've mentioned the, the funding of higher education. It is, it is, you know, it is something which is, is part of the mix. Though, as I did say earlier on, it is not where you would start that review and that that, con that conversation. Um, just a couple of other points then. So slippage in the city deal spend. So my rough calculations. This year, we only spend 18% of the budget within the department on city deals, and Ocean Aid's obviously raised how far on Belfast is. I would contend with that in some aspects. Um, and, you know, I'm just keen. Do you think the department can speed up spend then in the incoming years now that we'll have more heads of terms signed that other projects will move forward? Um, we spent 5.9 million of a budget of 30. Um, Will the minister, you know, keep that as a priority? He, looking down his balance sheet, seeing such a low spend, will he recognise that you know this will progress and be able to be spent in the in the coming months? Obviously, the city and, and growth deals are like a tremendous opportunity yeah. for Northern Ireland. A billion pounds of external funding being brought in. I think the preliminary stages of all of the projects and the and the deals has actually taken a lot longer than any of us would have hoped for. And I think I've mentioned that I want to try to see what we can do to speed that part of the the process up significantly. Um, a lot of money means you have to be you have to be sure that you're spending on the right things, but you, you can achieve that and and make progress as well. So that's definitely something that we're we're wanting to to make sure we we do make maximum use of it. Also, um, aside from the fact that you want to move the projects on, uh, the partner organisations, um, the, the amount of city deals money is fixed. And the partner organisations, if there is delay uh, with construction and inflation costs, obviously the costs for them go up and the risks for them. Um, so we want to make sure we, we don't. Um, Transfer a large amount of risk onto third party organisations when that can be avoided. Okay, and page 26 of the first day brief provided to the Minister on non domestic RHI. Yeah. The copy provided by to the committee is quite heavily redacted. Um, just Okay, um, I will say that the committee will be briefed on the issues that are in that redacted okay. section in a, in a um, in a number of weeks, I don't know, we couldn't say precisely how long it is. What's going on there is we have an administrative arrangement with Ofgem in relation to um, their delivery of the non domestic RHA scheme for us. So the material in there relates to the uh, time frame and other commercial relationship aspects of, the, of that arrangement. Now, once we have, we haven't yet concluded any negotiations, and the, the details are still. They're not, they aren't actually in the redacted section, but they, they relate to potentials and that's kind of speculative. So at this point, it's still quite commercially sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and so we will obviously brief the committee whenever the uh, arrangements are concluded and we know what the details are and we can tell you what the position is at that point. And my final question is in relation to regional balance. So I think as the only Belfast representative here, um, I represent North Belfast. A lot of these high-value jobs may be based in North Belfast, but I'll tell you, a lot of the people I represent don't work in those jobs. And uh, we have the factories, and we have the commuters, and we have the people coming and parking in our communities, but we don't see the wealth um, spread out amongst the communities that I represent. So mm -hmm. it's just to make the point that regional balance is also not just about where the locations of That's these great. jobs are are placed, but also about the communities that impact for them. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't matter if these people live in Tigers Bay or the New Lodge, they have um, industrial yep. heartlands within their communities and dividing communities, but very few of those people living in those communities actually work in them. So I just want to say that when we do regional balance, it's also not just about where the uh, factories are based, but it's also about who works in those too. Uh, given how good we have been with time, I'm going to open up one further question for each member, if they do wish. I know a couple have, so Mike, start with you. Hey, thank you. Just coming back to, to tourism, Ian, yep. is there an impact assessment uh, on the, the Electronic Travel Authority? Uh, and could I ask you maybe to encourage the Minister to seek a derogation from, uh, from London? Unless, of course, the committee took a view that we wanted to write to the minister in, in those terms. And 
David, you mentioned economic inactivity, which I think is a blight because of the percentage is so high. Would you agree that, that the best way to tackle it is as an executive priority because it has to be an interdepartmental initiative? Do you want to go first? I'll go first then on, on tourism. Um, yeah, um, very early on taking up this job, I got myself in a little bit of trouble because I made a, a statement at, at a Tourism Ireland event to the effect that um, sometimes feel that Whitehall civil servants forget that the UK has got a land border. And so whenever they design the electronic uh, travel authorization scheme, they had neglected the, the, the situation that we have got. And um, so some people took a bit of umbrage at it. But I think effectively the problem is the scheme is designed for people flying into airports in Great Britain or arriving at ferry ports in Great Britain. Um, and um, what they what they were telling us at the time was it could take 48 hours to get um, one of these authorizations done. Um, now, if it's an ele electronic or a digital service, it should be pretty much instantaneous, which is what the American um, system now is. And um, so we were expressing concerns about this because if you have to wait a couple of days, then the the fact that 70 percent of our international visitors come from uh, from the Republic, norm normally arriving through Dublin Airport, means that we could lose substantial numbers of people on day trips. Um, I think still something like 40 something percent of the people who visit the Giants Causeway, international visitors, come from day trips from the Republic. Now, if the process is even perceived to be difficult and arduous, um, even if it isn't in, pr in practicalities, um, then tour operators will simply cease to opt for that option. Um, I think that's, that's where the real um, challenges and so uh, we have been making representations about it. The minister has been uh, in contact with the Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance, who have been quite vocal around this. Mm -hmm. um, there have been requests for derogations around this um, for, say, uh, up to a seven-day grace period. Um, the, the response has not been positive because it interferes with what the UK government is attempting to do, and they have a concern, obviously, then about internal movement within Northern uh, within the UK between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, by people who wouldn't have the necessary authorisations. Um, but the conversations are, are continuing um, and, and will continue to, to make sure. I'm sure that our minister will be in contact with the UK government in relation to this issue. In terms of economic activity, like I, I've been at this for a long time. My previous life, I was in the benefits world. and you know, like I, you know, You're absolutely right. This isn't one department could possibly own this because you know, you, the, the Senator was talking about childcare the other day, and mm -hmm. childcare is a, a major yeah, impact, yeah. but equally, you know, long term sick in Northern Ireland is nearly double what it is in GB. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a fact that we have unique problems. I don't want to say we're worse than everybody else, but, you know, that is the nature of, 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 of our society here that people have different conditions that makes our economic country much different from elsewhere. So, on the impact that is, we see on health, because they're dealing with mental health issues, we, we have the benefit system that sometimes doesn't work. For it. We have childcare, which is Department of Education, ourselves. We're trying to tackle raising the economy, but through inclusivity. So you're absolutely right. It's not something that one department has any of the levers for. It needs a collaborative approach. There's there's a lot more of that happening. Of course, could we do more? And yes, and that's something that we will be looking to do through our new economic strategy. Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And it was just a point that you had raised in relation to the department's view in relation to uh, revenue raising. And one point of concern across manufacturing has been the consultation out at present in relation to industrial derating. Uh, has the department a view on how that will particularly impact upon the manufacturing sector? I know there's a lot of unease and many in our manufacturing sector regarding increased costs, uh, increased energy bills, post-Brexit trading difficulties, particularly as they're subject to the red lane. Um, there is a lot of unease as to this is the job creators and these are the people that fill these factories that we're, we're talking about. Has the department a particular view on that consultation and the impact it may have on manufacturing? A bit conflicted since I was the chief executive of LPS when the consultation was, was issued. So better was man to answer. Right. <laughs> um, uh, there was no impact assessment um, undertaken as part of the consultation that, that the Department of Finance released on the, on the rates measures, um, including in relation to the manufacturing uh, industrial derating relief. Um, now, obviously it will have a, a significant financial impact on, uh, on a number of manufacturers, um, but the, the spread of the, the size of these manufacturers is quite wide. Some of them um, have got industrial derating relief, but their premises are actually quite small, and they would still qualify for things like small business rates relief. At the other end, then you've got factories with readable values into millions of pounds, mm -hmm. and the removal of the relief would be 
you know, quite significant sums of money for them. Yeah. Um, and especially in some sectors where you have had difficulties um, um, over the COVID period, um, yeah. I, I think it, it potentially you know, would be damaging. We don't have a definitive assessment of that. Um, obviously, if the Department of Finance is looking at it in more detail, um, after this consultation is completed, they will have to produce as part of the policy development process and impact assessment. We would know better at that point what we think the, the, um, the likely impact is. Having, having said that, whilst I was still in LPS, we were already getting some, um, we're getting some representations which basically said we should retain the relief, but look at what um, is actually qualifying for it. I think and use it more effectively. Um, there are some sectors which potentially still qualify for industrial day rate and relief, which um, you know, which which maybe don't require it to the same extent as the more advanced manufacturing might do. Through the chair, I do think this is something that the department really does need to be keeping a, a live watch on because it has can have significant impact in, in terms of, of jobs uh, right across Northern Ireland. Thanks. For sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of the things that we had talked about at our session at the start was the issue of skills, and I have a particular interest in careers advice in schools. And we have met with um, representatives from your department over the last two-year period. And we know, coming off the back of the Independent Review of Education, that there are very specific elements in there. And David, you've referenced, as I had referenced at the start, that sort of cross-departmental working and the need to really do that, because otherwise we can't expect one department in isolation to meet some of these really tricky issues. So do the department have any plans to actually implement anything coming off the back of that independent review of education and joint working through DE and what would that look like? Um, the, the major um, recommendation relating to this department that was in that review was was essentially to take the responsibility for further education out um, and put it into a, a, like a larger department for education. That's mm -hmm. a very big structural change. It probably would take several years to do and it would be quite expensive. So um, unless the, the executive collectively says that is something which I think would be uh, they would want to do, um, we haven't started any work on in relation to, to that. Now, there are lots of things you can do um, which aren't structural changes, which would improve the way we work jointly, especially in the skills arena. Um, mm -hmm. There are quite a lot of inefficiencies in the system which mm -hmm. we can uh, work together to remove and deliver a better service for the people who are actually requiring it. Uh, for the young people that are affected, and that involve better sharing of data, better modelling of of, uh, of need and demand, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so that is the space that we we are um, looking at what we can do to improve actively in, in that kind of arena. Mm -hmm. Okay, I suppose in terms of just obviously there are careers advisors within the department, and my concern would be that while those people are sitting there with levels of expertise, I can't guarantee today that every child in Northern Ireland will be getting access to the same information about careers and skills and the difficulty for us here is that whenever that doesn't happen it then comes through to the economy and I want to work together as you say Ian to break down those barriers and I do think we have a role to play in that um, in terms of policy and certainly in terms of the operational delivery of that policy so I'll be watching closely to see what the plans are around careers advice there. Oh, I think the, the way to approach it um and coming from a service delivery organisation into what is now a policy department, I think one of the things we can do is actually start to look at who the, the customer or user of the service is in this mm -hmm. case, um, as opposed to the structural responsibilities of the different parties, work out what that would look like and operate how it would operate more effectively and then work to, to see if we can implement that. And that would be an approach I'll certainly be wanting to speak to colleagues in Department of Education about. You make a really point about you know the fourteen nineteen strategy. Mm -hmm. We've been looking at because there's, there's a real attention between sixth form college wanting to keep students on mm -hmm. and FE, mm -hmm. and actually you know we we need to find what is the right outcome for the person as opposed to what what keeps mm -hmm. what keeps a budget in a school or an FE college going. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure that we've got that balance right yet, so or not. And therefore, you know, doing the right thing and looking at the outcomes, and then. You know the the form will follow that, and I think that's what the fourteen nineteen strategy has looked mm -hmm. at, which has gone into the wide review of DE. So I think there are things we can mm -hmm. look at with all the departments without having to structurally reform. That that's one of them. We need to we need to put more into our FE and the outcomes for for, for those. Yeah.
those learners as opposed to just what is what is their I mean, parents or or what careers advisors have well, pushed them towards. This, this is exactly it, and you know, coming from that HR background, I mean, one of the things we used to talk about was can we actually just do a night for the parents <laughs> instead? Because often the young people were so much more ahead in terms of wanting to do higher level apprenticeships, wanting to get on. And you know, whenever I was sitting on the other side of the table, you know, of course you're going to want to, you know hire the person with more practical experience gained in the workplace and you can only really do that by making sure that every child you know across the north is getting that information in an impartial consistent and independent way um that as you say doesn't speak to necessarily outside influences um so i think that's that's the challenge for us all thank you Sinead. thank you chair um just going back to um you raised the issue about the command paper um recently and about the east west um relationship and enhancing that and supporting that relationship and uh, i think everybody would agree that that's really really important uh for businesses here to have access to all markets but one of the things in the command paper um what they they, they talked about the all island economy saying it was divisive and misguided and i think that's a real fundamental fundamental misunderstanding of what actually happens here um, in Northern Ireland and I suppose from uh, from um, the Northwest uh, uh, you know it like it happens we are an all island economy we are a Northwest cross-border city region and I think that um, you know what what are the plans within the department to enhance that relationship and have more collaboration because we cannot you know be in a, a competition for example for investment we need to be in collaboration for for a region uh, such as the northwest and and i think for the island as well we have an all island uh, energy strategy uh, as well and and when we're addressing climate change we've got to do it in the island context so what what are your views on enhancing that cooperation particularly around uh, investment uh, and bringing investors into the, the, the spatial area and the collaboration between um, IDA for example uh, and Enterprise Ireland with organisations such as Invest NI because I think the synergy is there and we should um, uh, you know do everything that we can to enhance it and bring uh, bring investment to the space. I think the um the discussion is sometimes marred by um, um, a sort of a zero-sum game um, consideration here. That it is either this or it is that. When in fact, it, it, that's not um, that's not going to be a productive way to to approach it. Um, so the um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to have to tread carefully here, so I don't stray into political sort of uh, territory around this. Um, there are there are things we can do. As well, I mentioned that's been uh, speaking to the new chief executive Invest NI last week. Um, I think he would be keen to, to see what we can do jointly with the IDA around promoting um, Northern Ireland and Ireland together as opposed yes. to competitors in international markets. I think um, externally, especially the further away you go from Northern Ireland um, and into the non-English speaking world, the distinction um, becomes something it's people awesome. simply don't understand. It's mm-hmm. lost. And so we, we could, rather than sending you know, uh, competing missions out there, look about what we can do. Certainly the Scandinavian countries show how they approach that um, by collaborating and working together quite quite effectively. Um, so there are there are definitely areas in where we can we can um, we can look at collaboration ar- around that inward investment sort of piece. Um, we have got an all Ireland um, electricity market, mm-hmm. so there are there are lots of um, examples of it of it operating in, in practice. And the nature of the border is, is such, and I, and I mentioned that Mr. Nesbitt about dealing with officials across in, in Whitehall that, that tried to explain to them it looks an awful lot like the border between England and Wales. Uh, and the major thing that's different is there's two languages on the on the road signs on one side of the border compared to another. And that that is just the realities of how it works in, in practice. Um, so I think that um, obviously we want to, to make sure that there are no barriers or impediments uh, and we're not locked into a, a kind of a, a zero-sum game. It, it's not a matter of moving, I think, economic activity from one direction to another. As part of that, it has got to be what we can do to grow the economy as much as we possibly can, taking advantage of all the connections and the, the links that we've got. Thank you. Thank you. 
And finally, Gary. Thanks, uh, Chair. Obviously, there's such a broad range, and I think we really need to do a deep dive into each of the mm -hmm. individual areas, uh, particularly around the, the university piece. Um, I think it's important that you know we do hear from the universities. I just wanted to touch very briefly on, on two very, very quick points, and it's in the back of David's point in terms of Invest NI's capability um, you know, a, a across the globe and promoting Northern Ireland in terms of what we have to offer. I think we do need to see, you know, we always talk about, you know, I've been in politics just for 15 years and I've heard collaboration and silo working and we're still doing it. Uh, and, and we continue to do it in terms of, um, you know, we, obviously the executive office have a role in term, terms of their various offices. I think it's important that Invest NI are working very closely with them in terms of uh, telling people about our trading arrangements here uh, and ensuring, obviously, that we, we take full advantage of, of what we have. Uh, the, the point that I wanted to make in the question was around the, the tourism economy, which I think is, is, is sort of, we're, we're, not, we're not maybe just tapping into it as well as we should be. Uh, obviously, we have the events that, um, sadly, some of them we haven't been able to secure, uh, but the likes of the open are vitally important uh, to our tourism sector, but there's a growing market out there in terms of conferences. Uh, I speak to, to local hotels within my constituency who are, who are trying to almost seek support for you know, bringing the likes of golf tourism, for example, major conferences uh, to Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think that will help in terms of the, 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 the balance piece and bringing investment in. What are your thoughts, Ian, in terms of direction for that? Uh, I think that, the, the, you know, is it something that the department's looking at to, to ramp up mm. that type of engagement for the tourism sector? Um, well, the tourism industry has, has come on tremendously uh, in the last uh, number of years. So obviously it was badly affected by the, the COVID pandemic. Um, I think in 2019 we'd, we'd hit a billion pounds of, of economic contribution to, to Northern Ireland. Um, and last year almost it got back up to that, that same level. Um, so obviously it's re rebounding. Um, there are lots of opportunities. Uh, regional um, regional um, distribution is, is also one of those things which has, has come up in discussions with the with Tourism NI about how we can manage that. Um, the conference market, um, quite a lot of work was done there by the Belfast Visitor and Convention Bureau, um, going back a number of years, or Visit Belfast, I think it's now known, but that's a, a, a city council-led mm -hmm. initiative, yeah. working jointly. Um, so there are things that can be done jointly with local authorities to try to, to look at some of that that regional promotion. Um, quite often it's it's a case of making sure you've got the package um, that people will be looking for. So uh, Belfast has spent quite some time building up that package of accommodation and conference facilities and other um, mm -hmm. you know, other attractions which would make it a, a viable site. And you've got to know your market segment. Yes. So um, Belfast, for example, has targeted a particular size of conference because that's what the International Conference Centre can hold. So again, in other locations, what you'd be looking for there is what, what have you got in terms of an accommodation base, what can the facilities um, hold, uh, mm -hmm. and what kind of segment of that market, international market, would you be willing to, to target um, in order to try to achieve the best uh, result for your particular locality. So there's, there's quite a lot can be done um, in other places outside Belfast to try to pick up on, on all of that. We have, I think, still got a lot of potential in the tourism industry here. They are, like some other sectors, um, facing issues with recruitment and resourcing and staff um, and uh, we'll try to work with them around skills in the hospitality and, and tourism sector sector as well but th there's still a lot of potential and a lot of growth I think in that market. Sorry, sorry, sorry go ahead. Sorry, tourism and I actually have just launched a few months ago, well, I think it's still open, mm -hmm. their strategy for, for the next decade and everything you said is in there, their ambition of how they grow the market and how we, we attract people here through events and a range of things. So uh, that, that consultation I think is still live but certainly it, it backs up and it, I think you'd be very keen to see it because it, it supports everything you were saying. Thanks, Chair. And obviously, it's something that we definitely will come back to in terms of getting a, a wider update on that. But I think that in terms of our event industry, uh, there is a feeling, unfortunately, um, you know, I use an example of the likes of the Northwest 200, where mm. you know every year it's an issue, a topic. It brings in hundreds of thousands of visitors. Uh, they just don't feel that the department, or particularly Tourism NA, gives them the value uh, that they rightly deserve. And I just think it's something that, that, that we really need to tap into because it's a growth, you recognise it's a growth area. And I think that um, you know, we have the assets, uh, that just, you know, they need the support. So thanks, Chair. With that, thank you. And on behalf of the committee, Ian and David, can I thank you both for coming? And I think I speak on behalf of us all, and we look forward to working with you positively in the time ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep, so...
I'm sure the clerk described a number of actions which I have got one if okay. basically write to the department seeking further information on the return on investment for NI Screen Invest NI Tourism Ireland and Thank you. Um, uh, NI Tourist Board. Can I chair maybe two two matters arising. Would would the committee agree with me that, that I think there would be some value in the chair writing to the minister? to say that uh, we are aware of the concerns within the hospitality and tourism sector of the potentially extremely negative impact of the ETA and that we would encourage him and support him in seeking a derogation uh, because it's a very bad fit for Northern Ireland. And, and the second thing is that I think we're coming on to the forward work programme but when, when we do could I suggest we issue an invitation to Joe Kennedy III to so come and the, uh, speak to us. Agree, Chairperson. So is that agreed? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Chairperson, to the committee, I think, Mr. Sorry, to Mr. Buckley, I think, wants to come in? Yeah, no, it was, it was just briefly, I was following on from Gary's point, arising from the briefing, um, in relation to the, the business conference sort of tourism aspect. I, I was aware, I think, that there was a, um, a proposal setting approved by Minister Lyons before the collapse that had actually enabled them to go much further, particularly in the conference space and enabling an organisation like Visit Belfast to coordinate on a more Northern Ireland wide basis. It was something that was certainly very interesting. I didn't, re I didn't want to, there was no ability to come back in at the end, but it certainly could it be something maybe that the committee could reach out for further detail on as to its progress. The department, so it's right. The department. It was about uh, arrangements for to allow for regional conferences. Yeah. So it was a, a particular Support business that. conference um, policy change that would would enable Visit Belfast to promote sort of business conferencing right across the Northern Ireland sphere. And I, I think that it w it was sitting. It was ratified by the minister, but was sitting with the department. And I would just like to to know where that was at present. Person, does the committee also want to write to the department and seek sight of the tuition fee paper? I don't, I'm not sensing that members are in favour of, of tuition fees being changed, but just there's there are issues with the student loan book mm -hmm. that they're not they're just quite hard to explain. They're sort of financial issues. So just the, the paper might give you a little bit of background on that, and um, we just might inform your understanding. Are you content to do that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, Chair, one other point, and you, you raised this, I think it's a very important one given where we are at present, but you talked about the department and, and revenue raising, uh, in particular some of the key aspects that might impact upon the department. Um, I think it is important that we explore where the department's mindset is on many of these different aspects. Like I, I raised one, obviously it's a, a finance consulta Department of Finance consultation, but the impact upon the Department of Economy, particularly in manufacturing, is something that I think actually there hasn't been much really reference to or cross departmental working to understand the implications. We told there was no impact assessment. That's just one uh, particular area. I'm sure there's others. So I, I think probably we need to be exploring, you know, what is actually on the table and, and what its impact is across to the economy. In terms of this industrial debriefing? Yeah. Yeah. I think the committee would just be keen and I know that the permanent secretary was able to give some indication. Obviously it will be for a minister to decide, but any potential revenue raising that the department does, I'm sure the committee will want to scrutinise. Yeah. Okay. I think in terms of the industrial duty rating, just remember his info and the, the, the chair is on the finance committee. I think they have planned to get a briefing from the Economic Policy Centre in UU and they'll also be hearing from LPS about Reval 2023 etc. So there's that and I'm sure they'll hear about the industrial duty rating too. So they, they, they will be on that, I would have thought, Chairperson. Sorry, Chair. Sure. Yeah. Um, many of um, the business organisations are really concerned about that. I, I, yeah. I discussed it with the Northern Ireland Chamber um, last week uh, and also manufacturing and I, exactly. so perhaps maybe even getting a briefing from both of those in terms of the impact. Um, um, and particularly, um, I suppose, uh, Mid-Ulster, um, you know, the, the, the companies in and around that area um, will be very, very heavily impacted. All businesses in that, uh, in, in that uh, category will be. But, um, and those are, are, are pretty important for the overall economy of Northern Ireland in terms of manufacturing and export. Chair, is maybe committee content maybe at this point, um, maybe write to the Committee for Finance, indicating the things that the members just said asking them to take that on board when they're reviewing yeah. um, the consultation on, because they will definitely review the consultation on industrial de-rating, mm -hmm. and then they can 
Um, we can take it from there. I don't know if that's agreeable. Okay. Right. That's right. Okay. okay, we're going to move to item 30 members, general. Could we take a very short break? Yeah, good idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, do you want a break too? Just five, is that okay? Five minutes? Yeah. And we'll just stop. Yeah. Sorry. Committee room 30. Sound. 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 (laughs) 
Committee Room 30. Sound. 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 Okay, members, you're welcome back, and we're now going to turn to Ida. Oh, there we are. We're now going to turn to item number 30, General Correspondence Clerk. Uh, members, there's a large backlog of correspondence to work through. Um, there's correspondence, there's also correspondence from an individual of several hundred pages. I have not added it to this week's pack. Um, I put that into next week's pack um, because it was big enough already. Uh, I trust the committee are content with that approach because I have to ask you understanding orders if you are. Content. Great, good mm -hmm. um, I've also separated the correspondence into general and Westminster EU related and I've provided summary information for, um, for most of what has been received. So if we can try and knife and fork our way through this, um, if there are matters that you um, want to spend more time on, uh, you can just say so and we can put that into uh, a future committee meeting. But again, there, there's a load here. Okay, okay we'll start to try and go through them. Okay, uh, page 793 to 1195, we have a number of items provided under general correspondence. The first of which is the note from the Speaker's Office covering decisions taken by departments in the, ex in the absence of the executive. Members will have received that individually to their MLA email account. Also, are the, is the committee content to note those correspondence from the Speaker's Office? Content. Yeah. Okay. Page 833, members are asked to note a report from the Northern Ireland Audit Office on ministerial directions. And that will be work will be taken forward by the PAC. Are members agreed to note that report? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Page 887, members are asked to note of a notice of a review of the LRA. Is the committee content to write to the department seeking an update on the review and in respect of the rele relevant aspects of the review of public sector bodies which were undertaken by the executive in the previous mandate? Is that agreed? Yeah. Thank you. 889 members are asked to note a copy of a statement from the predecessor Minister of Finance. Uh, finance? Yes. Yes. yes okay. Yeah. <laughs> the Minister of Finance setting out the financial income. Uh, our turn, sorry, of 2021-2022, is the committee content to write to the department seeking an update on the financial outturn of 2022-23 and 23-24? Is that agreed? Thank you. Uh, page 897, members are asked to note for information from the department in respect of a consultation relation to miscarriage, leave and pay. Is the committee content to write to the department seeking an update on the policy and related legislation, which I'm sure the committee will look forward to seeing? Content, thank you. Uh, page 923, members are asked to note correspondence from the Department for the Assembly providing confirmation that if Tourism NI ceased to exist, the Department would provide pension contributions to the Nelgos scheme for their relevant employees. The Department indicated that the effect of this letter will save Tourism NI £260,000 in pension contributions. DOF has approved. Is the Committee content to write to the Department seeking information on the number of employees affected and the extent of liability to the Department? Mm -hmm. Agreed, thank yeah. you. Page 926, members are asked to note for information in respect of the Department's capital works programmes, which are mostly related to FE capital projects. Is the committee content to note that? Yep. Thank you. Uh, page 934, members are asked to note notification from the Scottish and Welsh, Par Welsh Parliaments in respect of legislative consent relating to a number of Westminster bills. Is the committee content to note those? 
content. Yeah, yeah. thank you. At uh, page 950, uh, members are asked to know correspondence from the Welsh Parliament Public Accounts Committee on the Common Framework for Procurement and Late Payments. Is the committee content to write to the Department to seek an update on the status of the relevant Common Framework and the Department's view on them? Mm-hmm. Agreed, thank yeah. you. Mm-hmm. At page 966, members are asked to note information in respect to review of the intergovernmental relations. Is the committee content to to note that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Page 984, members are asked to note a report from the Equality Commission and Human Rights Commission in respect of Article 2 matters and including some commentary on parental bereavement legislation. Is the committee content to note their report? Mm-hmm. Thank you. At page 113, members are asked to note notice of an appointment competition for the Chair of the Health and Safety Executive Northern Ireland, appointment to be made by 1 April 24. Is the committee content to note that correspondence? Yes. Content, thank you. At page 1114, members are asked to note correspondence from uh, AIB referring to the withdrawal of first trust banknotes. Is the committee content to note that correspondence? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. At page 113, one six members are asked to note a copy of the written statement from the predecessor Minister of Education indicating how the award of CA qualifications were to return to the normal post the COVID pandemic. Are we content to note that? Noted. Thank mm-hmm. you. At page one one two three, members are asked to note a copy of the Office of the Northern Ireland Executive in Brussels Activity Report from October to December twenty twenty three. We note that. And next week do we have the international Department coming? I believe we do, yes. Okay, so if any member does have questions, we can do it at that point. Uh, page 1156, members are asked to know correspondence from Carers NI requesting to brief the committee. Is the committee content to write and seek clarity on its plans to, le- to le- for legislation in respect of carers? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Page 115, members are asked to know correspondence from the system operator for Northern Ireland offering a briefing and tour of its Castle Race site. Is the committee content for the clerk to arrange the briefing as part of a future external meeting of the committee? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed, get to. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> no problem. Uh, page 1176, members are asked to know correspondence from the Construction Employers Federation requesting the opportunity to brief the committee. Is the committee content for the clerk to arrange a briefing as part of a future meeting of the committee? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, page 1183, members are asked to know correspondence from the EDGE Foundation providing information on further education and skills across the UK. Committee happy to note. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. At page 1184, members are asked to know correspondence, correspondence from Renewable NI requesting the opportunity to brief committee. Are members content that the clerk makes those arrangements? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Members are asked to note an invitation to the chairperson to attend the Northern Ireland Food and Drink Awards on the 15th of March 2015. Is the committee content for me to attend subject to my availability? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, members are asked to know correspondence from the Minister offering an informal meeting uh, of the Chair and Deputy Chair, which took place on Monday, um, covered earlier in the agenda. Yeah. We just note that that meeting took place. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. At page 1194, members are asked to consider an invitation for the Chairperson to meet with the Policy Chairman of the City of London mm-hmm. Corporation on the 27th or 28th of February to discuss financial professional service development in Northern Ireland. Is the committee content for me to meet subject to availability? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, any questions on the general correspondence? I think not. Clark? Members, in addition to the correspondence in the pack, a large number of other reports were laid or sent to the committee office during the period of assembly dissolution. These are listed at page um, 797. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've not included them in the meeting pack because of the volume of the papers involved. There's about 43 of them. If there is a particular item on that list of reports that you want to see or have questions about, please do advise me. I'm happy to make some or all of these papers available to any or all members. It's just it would be it's enormous, and I didn't want to send you a 10,000 page meeting back. Uh, in the meantime, can I, Chairperson, uh, uh, okay, in the meantime, uh, is the committee therefore content to note these reports at this time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, on that basis. Okay. Uh, Thank you. We then move to item 31, Westminster EU correspondence. Clark? Uh, members, as indicated, the committee has also received a large quantity of EU-related correspondence from the House of Lords and House of Commons committees on EU scrutiny mm-hmm. under Windsor framework. I've provided an index at page 1201 um, of this. Hold on, will I get to it? No, this is stopped. Um, which summarises the correspondence. 
Uh, at page 1205, the Assembly's EU Affairs Manager has happily provided an explainer about all of the many EU issues which may be of interest to the, e to the Economy Committee. Mm -hmm. I would suggest the Committee simply notes the numerous items of correspondence for now. These issues are by and large still live and subject to the consideration of the Windsor Framework Democratic Scrutiny Committee. Mm. The Economy Committee may very well elect to return to some of these matters. Also, the EU Affairs Manager has agreed to, I think, come and brief us next week. So she'll talk you through yeah. um, uh, the, the papers that she has provided. But there, there's a rake, there's like 83 different items of correspondence. Yeah. I make yeah. it 34 different issues about all sorts of things like chemicals and cosmetics and toy Ish. safety and batteries and VAT and stuff like that. So I propose that you would um, note it for now, uh, hear from the EU Affairs Manager next week. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps there might be correspondence from the Windsor Framework Democratic Scrutiny Committee setting out their remit and where we might work with them in the future. But for now, I would suggest just note <laughs> the role of that. Me and Johnny look at each other. And, and, and the chair. chair. And the chair. And the chair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, are we content with that approach? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, item 32, that a standard procedure that meetings should be open to the public unless there's a particular reason for deliberations on specific agenda items to be held in closed session. Could the committee agree that, as a rule, we be all our meetings be held in public session unless the committee agrees that there's an overriding reason for the solution? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I wish to refer members to the draft forward work program at page 1147. Under normal circumstances, the committee devises its own work program. The clerk has provided a suggested forward work, pram, work, yeah, forward work program in order to assist us, clerk. Uh, so, members, you can see it's at page 1447. Uh, so next week, we would hear from the examiner of statutory rules. She'll just tell you stuff about statutory rules. Um, and also, uh, the department will come along. So it's the second group of grade threes. It's uh, Moira Doherty, head of skills and education group. Shane Murphy, head of international relations and economic relations group. Um, and then additionally, Shauna, who is the EU affairs manager, would come along and talk to you about all of the stuff we, we just mentioned a while ago. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's next week. Week after, you then round off the grade threes with the energy strategy strategy and the uh, economic strategy and uh, something from Reyes as well and then you can see there are further further weeks after that so what I would suggest members do is take these briefings this mm -hmm. week next week the week after have a bit of a think of the, all the yeah. stuff you want to do we've already other things to add to that mm -hmm. and then maybe after Easter we might have a bit of a strategic Great. session think about what to do with the three years yeah. and because there's plenty to do for yeah. sure yeah. Chair yeah. Okay, members can tell with that approach. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other business, Mr. Nesbitt, you wanted to raise an issue in relation to the US Special Envoy? I was just saying, I would suggest we issue a, an open invitation to him to come and speak to the committee. Your con the committee's content, obviously, this will be the first time the committee has sat since his appointment, so we congratulate him, thank him for all his work, particularly in relation to the recent investment conference that he held here, and as Mr Nesbitt's articulated, that the committee would be very keen to work with him and would hope to see him in the not-too-distant future. Yes. Member agreed, members agreed with that? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, is there any other relevant business for the committee? If not, then members, the next committee will be next Wednesday, the 21st of February at 10 a.m. in room 30 in Parliament Buildings. With the question that this committee meeting does now adjourn, the committee is now adjourned. Committee room 30, signed.